All right. Is the uh, the recorder is on? Yes. Fantastic. If we could have uh, any members of the public sign in, please. All right, and we will call this uh, meeting to order. It is June seventh at six thirteen p.m. Secretary, if we could call the roll, please. Ivan Heredia. Here. Kristen Finn. Here. Rhonda Saxton. Here. John Miller. Here. Jim Chard. Here. Chris Cabezas. Here. Elise Lindstrom. Here. All right. Uh, if we have an approval of the agenda, any changes to the agenda? Move approval is written. Second. Second. <laughs> We need to call the roll on that. Yes. yes. Ivan Heredia. Yes. Kristen Finn. Yes. Rhonda Saxton. Yes. John Miller. Yes. Jim Chard. Yes. Chris Cabezas. Yes. Elise Lindstrom. Yes. We do have one set of minutes. Do we have a uh, motion to approve the minutes? From... So moved. Perfect. I'll second. And roll. Ivan Heredia? Yes. Kristen Finn? Yes. Rhonda Saxon? Yes. John Miller? Yes. Jim Chard? Yes. Chris Cabezas? Yes. Elise Lindstrom? Yes. And uh, if we could please swear in the public, anyone that wishes to speak. <laughs> Do we have any comments from the public that are not related to the items on the agenda? All right, moving right along. Uh, looks like we don't have any presentations. Legislative items. Uh, should I be reading in the hearing rules first? Or we're doing the city initiated legislative items? First? Chair, we can wait till the quasi judicial items. We'll start with the legislative. Fantastic. Historic designation 2021 278. Hi, good evening. Michelle Hoyland, principal planner for the record. And I have here um, accompanying me our director, Anthea Giannotis, and Mr. Rich Heisenbottle of RJHA um, Architectural Firm. Okay, so the item we are discussing this evening um, is consideration of ordinance number 2623 for the Atlantic Avenue Historic District. Uh, the file number is 2021-278. Uh, we were before the board in April with a presentation and we set the date for the public hearing, which is what this meeting is tonight. So I'm gonna jump right in. You have a staff report in your backup as well as the um, Atlantic Avenue Resource Survey report and in the copy of the ordinance with the attachments that include a table, list, and map. So to um, cover where we've been and how we've got to this point today, in 2015, mm -hmm. the Historic Preservation Task Force was formed by the City Commission. The Commission had asked a group of folks to come together to look at ways as to how to strengthen historic preservation in Delray Beach. Um, that group met for about two years and they presented their findings to the Commission in 2017 their recommendations. There was a list of recommendations that were included, but most notably and the reason why we're here is that the group suggested three new historic districts be created, one of which is the Atlantic Avenue um, area. The City Commission accepted all of the task force's recommendations at that time in 2017 and have we have added them to our comprehensive plan within the newly or newer created historic preservation element. And you can see here, um, policy HPE 1.4.8 
uh, calls out that a cultural resource survey assessment be done of Atlantic Avenue from 95 to Ocean Boulevard. Once that direction was given to staff, we engaged the services of Mr. Heisenbottle uh, through his firm to complete a study of that area. Uh, the area extended from 95, it was the block face, everything that faced Atlantic Avenue in uh, some very small circumstances because of particular resources, um, the study wrapped the corner of Atlantic Avenue near the Federal Highway pairs. So this is the report that's in your backup. This is Mr. Heisenbottle. I just wanted to give you a brief background on Mr. Heisenbottle. He is a historic preservation um, architect and interior design specialty. Um, he has served on many projects throughout the state of Florida. He's highly regarded throughout the state of Florida, including with the state of Florida Division of Historical Resources. Um, he has had his firm for uh, 40 years in Miami and Coral Gables. He's worked for the city of Delray Beach as a consultant on other resource survey projects. Um, he was, it's an honor to have had him engaged on this project. His continued affiliation with historic preservation, um, the University of Miami School of Architecture, and the number of different uh, accolades and recognition that he's received. We highly uh, relied on his opinion in this study. So what is a historic resource survey? It's comprised of a report and an analysis. That includes a purpose, methodology. It goes over a history of the city as well as the Atlantic Avenue corridor, defines the um, important architectural styles, historic significance of any property that's surveyed, lists of properties which can be considered historic, AKA contributing or non-contributing, and then provides a summary of recommendations. Um, is there enough context for a historic designation of a new district? Attached to the um, resource survey is a set of Florida master site file forms which documents um, each property and along with maps. Um, city staff provided yellow cards and building permit records. You can see here on the screen, a yellow card is in the bottom left corner. These, this is what existed before we had a computer system to record building permits. Uh, so they were recorded in writing and we still have those records. We uh, also provided analysis of the Sanborn maps, which are fire insurance rate maps from the 20s, 40s, and 60s, and historic photographs. This is what a Florida site file form looks like. It um, records the address of the property, its uh, proximate location in, within the area, the architectural style, the year it was built. Um, obviously, you can see here on the picture, we've got a photograph of the front, any architectural features of note, along with a map of its location. And that um, report provides an opinion uh, of significance. Why is that property considered historically um, important to a historic district. The report also included, uh, which the city of Delray Beach land development regulations include as well, what is the national register criteria for eligibility for historic property? And that's what you can see here on your screen. Um, the a consultant or a staff member who's engaged in a historic study such as this is going to look at that property. Was it associated with significant events? people um, that were significant in the past? Was there any kind of characteristic that the structure embodies, method of construction, architectural style um, that might represent the work of an artist or a master? Um, as well as, you know, was there any prehistory significance? And the city of Delray Beach uh, LDRs includes that criteria which is outlined within your staff report. So this criteria is utilized to look at the overall district. Um, we have to, you know, consider whether or not there is enough context here for a historic district. So the report demonstrated that there was context, that th this area qualified. And I remind you that the study area was from I-95 to A1A. 
there was not enough context between the area of 95 to Swinton. Uh, there was one property that potentially could be historic, which we've talked about in the past. Um, those owners, we've spoken with them and they may consider at some point in the future coming in and individually designating. But the study area that was recommended extends from Swinton to the Intracoastal Waterway along both sides of the Atlantic Avenue corridor. There was a secondary area that was recommended, which is not subject to this review this evening. Um, that's known as the Ocean Park District. I wanted to make note because some of our calls that we've received from the public have inquired about that district. Um, that's going to be the subject of a future study, a future effort. So we're particularly looking at Atlantic between Swinton and the Intercoastal. That area qualifies for designation to both the local and the national registers of historic places. Tonight, the consideration is for local. Um, a national register designation will also require a separate effort should the direction be given to move in, in that um, way. So this is a map, a black line map, we've got a few for you to look at, that provides the general boundary of the, um, not the general, the specific boundary, I apologize for saying general, of the properties in the area that would be included. So the, as I said, the area has been deemed to have historical and cultural significance. There is a uh, series of maps that we're going to look at as we move through that will give you an image and understanding of the time frame for when this um, general area was originally established, when these buildings were constructed. Uh, but overall, they portray and embody an architectural style that warrants uh, preservation as well as being associated with many of them um, prominent architects in the community, most notably Mr. Sam Ogren Sr. So the period of significance, what is that? That's the age, the time period where the construction occurred that is the most significant. So this is 1903 to 1968. Um, these structures, while there were some looked at after 68, there weren't enough to be included or there may have been changes that occurred um, that potentially affected that structure's historic integrity. So the district contains 70 properties, 44 are considered contributing or historic, 26 are non-contributing, and there's one or two parking lots included in that 26 number. So with this high concentration, 63% of the properties um, can contribute to the legitimacy of a historic district. We're gonna look at a zoomed in map, but I have this map here so you can understand the legend. Anything in blue is considered a proposed non-contributing property. Anything in yellow is a contributing property. You'll see orange on the left and green on the right. Those signify existing historic districts. Orange is the old school square historic district and green is the marina historic district. So we do have a little bit of overlap. Um, there are some red stars on the map as well. Those are individually designated properties that exist such as Old School Square, The Colony, um, Milton Meyer, American Legion Post, which is on federal. So here we see a zoomed in look. You can see that concentration um, with Veterans Park on the right side. Again, yellow is historic. Old School Square is over on the left. The architectural styles that um, were studied and that exist, predominantly masonry vernacular is our number one architectural style. Uh, we also have some minimal masonry, followed by streamlined modern mission. There are landscapes, which would include Veterans Park, where the shuffleboard courts and the um, open space area is. We have some mid-century modern, Mediterranean revival, frame vernacular, mixed, and other, which is the Atlantic Avenue Bridge, also an individually designated resource. So we have a few examples of what is frame vernacular architecture. Um, this is the original popcorn house, and it very much sits in its similar configuration to when it was originally constructed about 120 years ago. 
Um, so it's one of the oldest remaining buildings that we've been able to document within the city. And it, it's quite lovely that it's in such wonderful condition. Um, here we have what was most um, those who were, you know, old school Del Rey folks know as the arcade tap room. Um, this is Sam Ogren design. We have beautiful sketches, his hand sketches of this building. You can see in the picture on the bottom that is today. Uh, following a, a front facade restoration and renovation that occurred. This building's 97 years old and is Mediterranean Revival. Uh, this building is known as the Roden Building. Uh, it was formerly the location of Bull Bar. I think it's called Delray Yacht Club now. Um, this is 109 years old, masonry vernacular style, but this also falls within the old school square historic district and to date has been one of the oldest buildings that is within a protected historic district. So these are, are quite interesting. When we studied them, we've applied some color um, to the map on the right so that you can see the progression of construction that occurred when our city was um, first developing. The buildings in green are the ones that are fronting Atlantic. You can see there's many other structures on, on here, as well as the FEC Railroad, um, which is in so many coastal communities is responsible for the boom that occurred in our, in our area, in our communities during the 20s and later. But I think what's great is you move from that map to the next in just four short years. Uh, you can see how many additional buildings are constructed from 22 to 26. Mm. Then we jump to 49. So much construction happened, even, even at a time when we were going through the Great Depression um, and a world war. And then here is 1963. So we wanted to show you that progression of structures um, that had occurred for construction within that period of significance that's included in the, the survey. Um, so in July, this was not the first time that we had um, been before commission. We had been working with commission as direction came to them, um, came from them over the course of about a year and a half time period. Um, once the report was completed, we presented during a workshop and the commission directed staff to proceed with the designation of the Atlantic Avenue Historic District. Um, so we prepared which took a lot. Um, this involved, you know, pulling together legal descriptions for a very large area, um, public notices, quality controlling all of our documentation to ensure accuracy. And then we presented to HPB in April, just, um, just under two months ago, with our presentation of what did that report say, which was probably a little bit more of an enriched um, presentation and for those in the community who maybe haven't heard all of the details that's an important meeting July or April 19th to go back and listen to um, where we set our date so that's where we're at today I'm going to talk a little bit more about incentives um, because this was a direction that we occur we received from the City Commission um, to outline what are the existing in incentives and what are potential proposed incentives that can be looked at. So this is um, a screenshot directly from Mr. Heisenbottle's report. There are many different kinds of incentives available. Predominantly, the ones that are often most important to homeowners are economic incentives. Um, so right now, for any historic property that's within a locally designated historic district, they can qualify an addition to that building uh, for a historic tax exemption of ad valorem taxes, both city and county. That occurs for 10 years. Um, it remains with the property through sales. Should the district be designated as a national district, they would qualify for the federal income tax um, credit, which is a tax deduction. And these only work for income producing properties. So while we have two national register districts today, Old School Square and Marina, most of those um, property owners that are coming through, they occupy their home, so they can't get the federal tax incentive. Um, this essentially is if you spend a million dollars upgrading your building, um, 20, and, and it complies with the requirements of the program, 20% of that investment can be deducted 
from your taxes as a tax deduction over a five-year period of time, which would equate to $200,000 spread out in five years is a significant um, investment return. Once the five-year period is complete, you can continue on to make additional changes um, to your property. So it's not a permanent tie or any kind of deed restriction. Um, there are also uh, important things that we had a meeting this week and thinking about it after the fact, we want to go back and speak with this property owner who owns property on a state road where there's improvements that might be happening in the future. Whenever funding is involved with any state projects, they, the state and the federal government are required to engage with our staff to ensure that they're done in a sensitive way to not affect the building. So that's a, an important um, incentive for property owners that they get to protect that investment uh, through our assist and the, and the coordination. Um, some properties, and we'll talk a little more about this in the next slide or two, can um, have eligibility consideration for um, some exemptions to building safety code and ADA requirements. So we've talked about tax exemptions on the local. There's also eligibility for low interest loans. This can include an FHA loan program um, if you were having housing involved on the property, sometimes combining federal tax credits should it become a national district with housing tax credits uh, can be very, very advantageous for the property owner. We tend to see in historic preservation these types of tax credits utilized in commercial properties. Um, there can be grants available. I know our local CRA has different grant opportunities, but so does the state and the federal government. There's uh, quite a well of money to be utilized in opportune time right now. Um, so as the Historic Preservation Board, you can grant waivers and variances to code relief in the spirit of historic preservation. If you are a historically designated site, as one might be as a contributor in a district, you can qualify to request a waiver, or we would call it a variance, um, from having to comply with FEMA incentives. FEMA is pretty strict, particularly for our properties that are in a flood prone area. You add on, you have to elevate your building. Um, this board has the authority to grant a variance per the FEMA code requirements. There's also a consolidated review process. So let's not forget all of these properties, any modifications to them today have to go through SPRAB. So there's still a review process that occurs if they need relief of any kind, they likely have to go to Board of Adjustments. So now they have a two-part process. With HPB, that review goes to a single review process. There's also, um, when we were working through this process, we were also developing the Green Building Ordinance. And we, um, as staff, worked with the, the t community and the team and looked at do we want to exempt historic properties from compliance with green building? And the study returned that yes, we did want to exempt them. Realistically, because um, Carl Elefante wrote, you know, the greenest building is the one that already exists. So it is the most sustainable practice to preserve a structure. So you're already moving towards a more sustainable practice. Um, and in many cases, and I'll show you a few photographs, um, Existing nonconformities exist. Buildings uh, have no parking. They're built to their property line. They might have, an, they might exceed some intensity or density requirement. In many cases, those nonconformities get to exist because you get some um, historic exemption that's allowed by code. And then the Florida Building Code, Energy Code, and ADA. So there are specific e exemptions built into those of four historic properties that not historic properties do not get the benefit of. And that, that really can help in preserving a property owner's investment. What we are currently considering, these are incentives that are under consideration. Uh, we have just instituted a new program, EnerGov and Project Docs. This is a building permit software review. It's very technical on our side um, as staff but that is an expedited process to make permit review move quicker. Um, so we're looking at, is there a way within that process that we can make historic reviews move faster? 
even faster than our normal review. There are rehabilitation incentives that we're exploring, such as potential density bonuses, intensity, which is floor area ratio, for rehabilitated historic properties. Um, can we apply some additional parking adjustments for new additions or use conversions because it would be in the spirit of preserving a building? There has been discussion at a higher level about what are we doing with the in-lieu parking program? Are we retaining it? Are we going to be moving away from it? What We have to study what's the best and highest and best use for the, that money that's in the, the kitty. We propose as staff and have at many um, opportunities when asked about it, preserve the use of in lieu for historic properties. So if the program goes away, we'd like to see it remain for use for our properties to encourage these property owners to be able to make additions and make modifications. And then lastly, a transfer of development rights program. Uh, the code currently has a TDR program, but the parameters are very specific and would need some level of revision to the code. But what is a TDR program? So you have your historic property, you have some development right, maybe it's height or additional units. Can you transfer that to a different property elsewhere? Um, and you would retain your property as it sits today. And it's more complex use of a code entitlement that needs to be studied further and that we're considering. Benefits. This was a long part of my presentation last time, so I'm going to move a little more swiftly through this. Um, the benefits reach far for historic preservation. There's educational benefits. Think our local nonprofits, um, historical society, Spady Museum, these groups that are um, enriching people and children about history in our community, native plant communities. Um, cultural goes along with this educational element. You know, we're preserving a, a culture that occurred here at some point in time for moving forward and telling that story to our children as they, they age. Many people, and it's a booming industry, you plan a vacation, oftentimes you're going to a place where you can visit some level of history, whether it's a museum. Um, a lot of folks go to look at battlefields uh, touring old buildings. It, heritage tourism is a huge economic driver throughout the world, and there's documented numbers on this, which I have in background slides, if you ask, um, and wanted to see it, I could show it to you. Aesthetic. Uh, we're preserving what our community looks like. This is you know, the community that we've been calling for many years the village by the sea. Um, that character and aesthetic was created, and we've been working and preserving that over the years. Social and jobs, I think that's fairly straightforward. Jobs, there are specialty trades that get to work within historic preservation. Mr. Heisenbottle is a historic preservation architect. Um, and anything from trades, even to the merchants that are, have a business within a thriving downtown are employing folks and contributing to the economic impacts of jobs. Property values. We have talked about Mr. Donovan Ripkema and his studies that he did during the early 2000s. Um, thank God for the recession is what he has said in presentations because it gave him an opportunity to look at his property values. What happened? Um, while property values for the masses were in a state of decline, he found that historic properties retained value or increased during that time period, which was shocking. Um, so we've listened to his studies, we've presented to the board in the past his information. Um, historic preservation is a huge driver to ensure values that create a sense of place that people want to be in. That environmental impact, which we've talked about just a few minutes ago, the oldest building, the greenest building is the oldest building. By preserving the structure, you're keeping man hours and materials out of the landfill. Um, the, those things don't disappear, they just move places when you tear a building down. And then downtown revitalization investing, which I'm gonna touch on in a little bit more focus here. 
These are two examples, the Capital One building on the left, and again, the arcade tap room, which is now, I think, called the wine room on the right. First and foremost, this is providing you an understanding that buildings, changes can still be made to buildings as long as they're done in a compassionate way, consistent with the architecture, that it's not stripping that original character. And both of these projects did a really nice job of executing updates and improvements um, that would comply with historic regulations. But these buildings also sit on property where they have little to no parking. Um, that is not likely going to change. The same can be said for this building here, which is just directly to the east of the Capital One or what many of us know as the old Green Owl. This is across the street from that. And these are aerial views of some of these properties. The one on the right, you can see in the upper right corner is the original popcorn house. So this is a combination of an entire block with multiple property owners. And I count three cars in this picture. So that parking is vested. They're non-conforming. That's a value add for these properties. Um, the same is the case on the left where there's absolutely zero parking spaces on site. Uh, for that property, which is where the Capital One is. So the Historic Preservation Ordinance that was created in 1989 would be applicable. That really covers visual compatibility for the most part. That's a protection of character of historic structures. The individual zoning district regulations remain. So these properties are largely zoned CBD. There's some other zoning um, such as open space and recreation as well as OSHAD, um, those zoning designations continue to apply. Um, I want to talk a little bit about process. You can see this is a lovely opportunity for us. We have so many wonderful members of the public here who are interested in this. This is because we sent out nearly a thousand mailers to everybody within the proposed district um, and every property owner within a 500 foot radius of the district. And we publish an advertisement in the newspaper. Additional notice will occur once this moves forward, should the board recommend approval tonight, will occur before the uh, commission's second reading. So I wanna talk through the compliance with the Always Delray Comprehensive Plan. Um, this is an aerial view uh, you can see IPIC up in the left corner of the um, picture. You see the orange building, Big Al's property there. This is looking west along Atlantic Avenue. So I just want to read this. I think it's, it was impactful for us when we were developing the historic preservation element and the update to the entire Always Delray comprehensive plan. This is the vision statement for the entire comp plan. Delray Beach is a vibrant, award-winning, all-America city composed of a charming downtown village by the sea and dynamic, diverse neighborhoods. We proudly celebrate our historic heritage and look forward to a bright future. Our goal is to provide a high quality of life that is healthy and welcoming for residents, visitors, and business owners. And I thought it was very interesting and you know, the, the city should definitely have a kudos for the work that they've done to preserve historic preservation and continue to make that a priority. Um, the community, the leaders, the staff, it's um, very important to the success of our community. Um, the city has won the All-America City Award three times. We were the first city to do that at the time in 2017. They were named the fifth best small city for small businesses in the U.S. by Verizon Business. Coastal Living Magazine is named the city America's Happiest Seaside Town. We are the 10 best little beach towns in Florida by Coastal Living as well. USA Today has named Atlantic Avenue one of America's 10 great shopping streets. This success occurred, if you, for those of you who were here and remember or have heard the stories, Old School Square was slated for demolition. The school board had abandoned the building, put a fence around it in the 1980s. 
and there was talk of a bowling alley going there or a Kmart. And the city came together and said, let's preserve this. Let's make sure this central point of our community is preserved. The Historic Preservation Ordinance was created at the same time. This was 89, 87, 88, 89. The city invested in the Old School Square property. We have a wonderful cultural arts facility where children and artists and adults can go for a variety of programs, opportunities with a museum, a theater, performing events, amphitheater. Um, that investment helped a downtown that was dying. You would not go to Atlantic Avenue after dark in the 80s and even into the early 90s. That commitment that the city made, that they identified in their 89 comp plan going all the way back to that point, ensured that our community had a revitalization. It had a renaissance. And to now, tonight, I mean, I'm thinking any night of the week you can go to Atlantic Avenue and have something wonderful to do, whether it's shopping or arts or eating. That's a success um, that the city really ensured happened. And our downtown had been revitalized. This is an image of what it looked like. Um, not quite back to the 50s, but we were probably in the 60s, late 60s, early 70s in this photo. And what you see on the left is hands. That was how hands originally looked before the 1980s arcade that has since been um, taken off. This is from the Always Delray comp plan. Um, this is that revitalization that I just spoke about. That historic preservation set the stage for Delray Beach's downtown and in turn protected historic and cultural resources. That preservation-based economic development, such as the idea of buying local, a concept was the foundation upon which the downtown and Delray Beach was built. Delray Beach is a testament that preservation is a tool that preserves cultural landscapes, buildings, sites, and it's a key component that is beneficial mm -hmm. to the success and health of a local economy. Here's another example in downtown revitalization. We have the old Sal's building on the left, which looks very much today like it did originally, yet they've been able to make some modifications, updating windows. Um, there was at one point a big pineapple mural on the side of the building. Uh, these merchants are thriving in this location. Then we go to our historic preservation element. This is the goals, objectives, and policies. So this is what guides how we um, handle anything to do within our city, whether it's um, development-based or capital improvement plan changes. What are we doing in growth? Are we doing growth? This is where we turn to is our, our comprehensive plan. The historic preservation element specifically identifies securing for future generation the opportunity to share in the unique heritage of Delray Beach and promote the preservation of historic archaeological, historic heritage of Delray Beach, sorry, I can't see, and historic archaeological and cultural resources through purposeful identification, protections, and continued use of building structures and districts, which exhibit significant architectural qualities or are associated with important cultural events and people in the city's history. And then we have our policies and how, we, how do we do that? Conducting surveys, conducting inventory, studying and evaluating. Our economic prosperity element also covers the importance of preservation um, in Delray Beach through support of programs, adaptive reuse of buildings, and encouraging preservation. So these are the policies that guide how we move forward as a community. The neighborhood districts and corridors element also touches on this. And if you look through the comp plan, historic preservation is sprinkled throughout every element in the entire comp plan. Uh, but NDC indicates again, encouraging adaptive reuse of structures. So what happens next? After tonight's meeting, um, the request, should you make a recommendation of approval, would move on to the Downtown Development Authority. 
the Planning and Zoning Board, and then City Commission for first and second reading. We're targeting July and August for those dates. Um, and then I just wanted to, it looks like it skipped here. Okay, I just wanted to touch on this because we're just coming off of National Preservation Month in May. The National Trust for Historic Preservation has designated since 1973 that historic preservation be honored. Um, the program was expanded to be a month long um, celebration in 2005. And so we do a celebration every year by honoring properties and people and, and giving awards for work well done. Um, I thought it was important to note that we are on the heels of May Preservation Month. This year's theme is People Saving Places, which is essentially a national high five um, to everyone who's doing the great work of saving places. In the past, the uh, theme has been This Place Matters. Um, those themes have gone on to inspire the work of different communities to really invest in their cultural heritage, in their architectural heritage. And so I thought it was just a, a good time to show you and remind you we had a great celebration in May um, and maybe we can keep the momentum going. And then finally, we're going to end on a few photographs um, of Delray Beach. This is very early Delray Beach. Um, Atlantic Avenue is on the left side here of the screen. In this photograph, you can see Old School Square, which was the school. So this was had to be post-1913 at this point. Um, this is probably around the 50s or 60s, Atlantic Avenue. You can see that development that really just popped up and flourished from the 20s to the 60s is still in existence. This is looking in the same view. The intercoastal is more prominent in this photograph. Uh, we have more high rises that have been built. Looking at our beach, looking to the west. And just a, a reminder, this place matters. Um, this preservation of a community, while preservation can be a difficult topic, um, sometimes people worry that it's too restrictive. I think this board has been moving towards a role and position of making preservation easier for people, um, making changes to their property something that's more attainable. The goal is not to make it complicated. The goal is to preserve our history. And then finally, and I've shared this photo before, this is from the DDA, um, an event which is Savor the Avenue. Um, just a reminder, I just thought this was a really good reminder, people saving places. Um, that concludes my part of the presentation. Uh, we also have Mr. Heisenbottle here, should you wish to hear from him or have any questions from him. And I think um, Anthea Giannotis, her and I have discussed some potential topics. I don't know if you want to touch on anything at this point or no. it's it. I did it again with the squeaking. I'm sorry. I'm not used to the new system. Excuse me. Anthea Giannotis, Development Services Director. I think um, this is a public hearing, so you're going to hear, I think, some questions and comments. and. Um, maybe once we hear that, um, Rich would, Rich is probably your best, Mr. Heisenbottle is probably your best resource, but uh, Michelle and I are here as well. So thank you. Okay. Thanks, Cynthia. So I think at this point we move to public comment. So I don't think that I've led this type of forum before. When we move to public comment, is it just an open forum? Are we three-minuting? Yeah, it, it'd be treated just like um, public just like, comment during okay. quasi-judicial items. So three minutes for an individual, six minutes if there's six other individuals in the room that agree not to speak, or six minutes for an uh, individual representing an organization. Fantastic. The floor is open.
to maintain is overly broad in that it does not particularly identify only those properties that are in the original scope of the plan. But more importantly, it disregards your entire, your entire legal history in this community. And I sat here and heard that entire presentation, and I understand you're harsh on the right place, but I need to remind you of some facts. First of all, we're here talking about property rights, other people's property, not your property, property that people have purchased based on what you have covenanted to do based on your law. An hour of talk about how this community has flourished how it was, you said, slum and blighted. You told the public under Florida Statute 163 in the 80s that downtown Delray was slum and blighted. Come here and invest. Invest in our new redevelopment district. We're creating a community redevelopment district. We're going to keep the tax increment money we're going to let you redevelop to the full potential of our zoning laws. Please come here and invest your dollars. And they came, and they came, and they came for the last 30 years. They invested their money in your downtown, and they improved their properties, knowing they have the absolute right to develop those properties to the full extent of your zoning laws. And now that they have had some modicum of success, I say modicum of success because Florida is about growth and renewal. That beauty you saw over the last 30 years didn't come from a preservation board. It came from a CRA. Not one word mentioned about the CRA this evening. I heard you're at the village. I live in Boca Raton, and I've been here in South Florida since 1965. And I've seen great redevelopment and I've seen terrible redevelopment in the 50 something years I've lived here, 59 years. But is this the village by the sea or is this the schizophrenic village by the sea? You can't on Tuesday tell investors we're slum and blighted Come here and invest, invest millions of dollars so you can redevelop, and then, and then when you start to see some success, say, we want to take a whole district that is a community redevelopment district where redevelopment is supposed to be ongoing, and we want to- We have to thank you for your comments, but you are over three minutes. So we're going to strenuously object to this, and it's over, it, it is overly broad, it's contradictory to your legal precedent, and we will fight this all the way. Mr. Sweetapple, can you just give us your address before you sure. step away? It's 792 Coquina Way, Boca Raton, Florida. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Price Patton, Price Patton, 1020 Chandler Road, Delray Beach. Um, Bob is an eloquent speaker. I haven't known him for 50 years, but I've known him for a long time. In terms of the economic um, the status of, of a good friend of mine who I've known for, for 40 years and couldn't invest in the town, and sold um, four buildings for $34 million. So there's, there's some money down. These are valuable properties, and, um, and it's important to um, preserve the nature of the downtown. And I think um, that's a clear indication that, that these aren't really um, poor, blighted properties. Anymore. I sent you all a resolution that, uh, that the Preservation Council uh, wrote. I don't know if y'all got it. It's a list for city email addresses. Um, I sent a copy to Michelle and the other preservation officers. No. Bob unplugged the microphone. <laughs> um, Quickly, let me read a, a resolution from the, uh, the uh, Delray Beach Preservation Trust, the 501c3. 
um, supporting the creation of the district. Our, our mission is to advocate for historic preservation and educate the public and city officials about the advantages of historic preservation. Whereas the majority of the buildings along Atlantic Avenue between Swinton and the Intercoastal have been deemed qualified for historic designation by a preeminent architect. Then we talk about the goals and historic preservation element, which uh, Michelle went over. Um, uh, and then whereas cities across the state, Key West, Miami Beach, Dunedin, St. Pete Beach, and St. Augustine, to name just a few, celebrate their heritage by creating urban historic districts. Where historic buildings, districts, and museums and heritage tourism brought in $3.6 billion last year to the state of Florida. Then we list the, some of the, many of the elements that uh, Michelle wrote about the advantages of it. And then, you know, Old School Stair was, Square was the, was the genesis for the, the revitalization of Delray Beach. So the resolution resolves that from the Preservation Trust that uh, urges the your board to recommend historic designation of Atlantic Avenue Historic District to the City Commission, urges the City Commission to list the designate said district as historic, urges city staff elected officials to seek new creative incentives to encourage and further sustain economic value in the district, and offers the services of the trust to help in any way we can. And I hope Mr. Chard will be able to talk about the good news from the City Council, City Commission last night regarding the golf course. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Hi, good evening. Uh, Linda Oxford, 148 Coconut Road. Um, in 1902, my grandfather arrived in Delray. In 1903, he developed the northwest corner of Atlantic and Fifth. Um, the house that, was, that he built was moved around 1924 and he built the existing buildings there on that corner now. Um, and they look the same except for the corner because that was originally a gas station. <coughs> My mother was born in that house, which is now the popcorn house. Um, that corner, as well as other corners in downtown Delray, are the quaintness of why people came. Um, the arcade tap room, I believe, was built about 1924-ish, same time, and, and um, northerners flocked. They, they, loved, they loved the area. Um, now, that property is a valuable piece of property. You know, um, we sold the property in 1969, I believe, for a little over $100,000. And it was probably worth $10 million today. Uh, the smartest thing that ever happened, I believe, is when J Jimmy Hallis ran and he owned the tap room and he ran into um, financial difficulty, difficulty and Leo Blair brought the property and he developed each piece of property as one condo. So there are a lot of owners for each individual. So I, I, I just hope you could keep downtown looking the way it is maybe 30 years ago, but you can't. But at least going forward, please preserve our historic buildings because we are so unique. We have a downtown and not many other places really have a downtown that you can get off 95 and you can go directly to the beach. And I, I was, the email that Vice Mayor Wilson just sent out, I like that he said, uh, we're going to go back to the basics. We are not just going to honor our past. We are going to engage in it by coupling the Delray Way in a community led. So I hope you lead. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to start my timer. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Billy Himmelrich. I own the Old School Bakery, which began its life at 105, 111 East Atlantic Avenue. Many of you know it as the Cabana Tremonti building. Um, I own four parcels of land. I've owned them for over 20 years. Um, I am one of the original investors that Mr. Sweet Apple talks about. But I also care about historic preservation, and I care about the charm of our downtown. Um, I didn't prepare notes. I have to say that um, the hour-long presentation was overwhelming and fantastic. And when I say fantastic, I mean it like feels like a fantasy. 
But if all those things that Michelle says are really going to happen and all those property owners are going to be able to benefit, that's fabulous. But understand that when I started my business, and I'm historic because I had the first espresso machine on Atlantic Avenue at the old school bakery 20 some years ago. So, you know, I, I just hope that you can take into consideration the fact that yes, property owners have rights and property owners have plans. And I've already been, I, well, I'm gonna use my word carefully. I've been the victim of a down zoning on Atlantic Avenue and they, um, you know, reduced the, the buildable height from um, 48 to 38 feet. And, you know, I, I lost the whole story. I made a claim against the city, many of you know that. I lost on a technicality because I didn't unify the title, even though I have identical ownership of all my structures. I think a lot of people here know me and know what happened. Regardless, you know, I'm here to invest in downtown today, no matter what happens. I am gonna be 60 years old this year. I, you know, go to work every day. I go to these properties, but as a property owner, I work hard at it, we've got rights. And I just wanna make sure that everyone takes into account the fact that in addition to preserving that which is historic, um, something unique about my property, I have 45 seconds. Um, part of it's contributing, part of it isn't. Some of it's an OSHAD, some of it isn't. Um, I want to make sure the city attorney's office is aware that it's not all an OSHAD, it's, it's a mixed use. So, um, you know, I have plans. Some of you have seen my plans. I'm not going to mention any names. People know I plan to develop this property. I hope I can develop it in conjunction with the city. We have bought the park. I, I, I genuinely just hope that you all can take into account that not just I, but everyone along this corridor have invested for many years. And, um, you know, we were there for the blight and we're there today and we want to be there in the future. And I hope you'll take into account that we need some protection too, not just the buildings. Thank you. Four seconds over. Mr. Hemorich, uh, just provide your address as well, please. Oh, um, so my mailing address is 45 North Congress Avenue at the Old School Bakery, but the, um, that's where I receive my notice. Thanks. Thank you. Michael Weiner, we have a business address at 44 East Atlantic Avenue, um, building I've owned for a quarter of a century. Uh, let's approach this from a little different manner. Um, there's many ways to love history. Everybody here wants to see history preserved. But if we go about it through government regulation over vast areas, are actually demeaning history. You can't protect everything, nor should you, because there's outstanding pieces of history. The Colony Hotel, the Clark House, and some other buildings that we could all just continue to name, and I'm sure I could use up the rest of my three minutes naming them. So what can we do best for history? to keep it close, to keep it as important as saving Old School Square. You can find those things that are great. But what does the report say? The report says that there's about 63% of these buildings left. That's what we've been told. And there's six different styles. Because they decided to use from the 1900s to 1968 as their base. Well, there's no consistency to Atlantic Avenue over 65 years. It's all different. And some from each of the periods of time in those six decades create something, but not a cohesive avenue that you can walk down and say, yep, that's from 1925, that's from 1927. No, those six styles of blend and shape and so it's difficult to say that this is actually a historic district, not over six decades of different styles. So what we really have on Atlantic Avenue, the history of Atlantic Avenue is eclectic. That's what did it. I know when I walked down Atlantic Avenue for the first time and decided to invest some of my money, I said, you know what? It feels real to me. 
It's not a shopping plaza. I know full well not everything was built at the same time. Got 34 seconds left. So, what I've got to tell you is, don't stop that. Their own examples said, look, people have been doing it right. They didn't need government to tell them to do the Capitol Bank building. They didn't need to do government to do the wine room. Why break it? Why get rid of the one thing that is basic in our history of Atlantic Avenue? Change, eclectic, being different, walking down the street and feeling a sense of the movement of time. I want to preserve history. There you go. That's the history I can preserve. Thank you. Thank you. Carolyn Patton, 1020 Tamarind Road, Delray Beach. I was born and raised in Delray Beach and moved back here as an adult. And I've probably gone up and down Atlantic Avenue thousands of times, and I love it. I would like to take the board and everyone on a walking tour through history down Atlantic Avenue. In the 1920s, there were two wonderful buildings that came to Atlantic Avenue, the Colony Hotel and the Tap Room. In the 1930s, there were illustrious cartoonists, among them Fontaine Fox, who drew, who drew the Tunerville trolley, who had offices on the second floor of the tap room. Now, when Fontaine Fox, who looked a little like Burt Reynolds, walked down Atlantic Avenue, where his office was, there were some ladies who swooned. In the 1940s, we had all kinds of soldiers from all different branches walking Atlantic Avenue, maybe looking for a place to, to live. The 1950s, in 1952, a, a wonderful shop came to Del Rey, Doc's Soft Serve. Also in the 1950s, some wonderful African-American artists walked up and down Atlantic Avenue, selling their paintings of native Florida. They're known as the highwaymen. They didn't get very much money for those paintings then. Now they sell in New York galleries for ten to $15,000 a piece. In the 1970s, Maury Powers, this wonderful Irishman who owned Powers Lounge, one of the earliest buildings on Atlantic Avenue, grabbed a pig and started walking in the Irish St. Patrick's Day Parade, and we all remember that. In the 1980s, things were getting a little run down, and the establishment of the Old School Square Historic District is one of, and the renovation of Old School Square were things that really brought the, the Atlantic Avenue back, helped it too. And between that time and now, the really important thing that hasn't been mentioned tonight is that when Kerry Glickstein was mayor of Delray Beach, he led the effort, and it was done, to limit the height on Atlantic Avenue to three stories. I think he got some lawsuits from maybe some people in this room, but he put that into effect. In this exact district, the height limit is three stories. So we already have that in place, and that's what you would have in a historic district. So I, I want to end with it. Many of the men on this wall over here, and women, excuse me, men and women, our mayors went down Atlantic Avenue in parades. And I hope we're able to save it tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jason Evans. I'm an attorney and I represent Delray Beach Associates, Inc and Patio Partners, Inc. My client owns the property on the south side of East Atlantic, just west of the Intercoastal Waterway, specifically the north facing commercial properties of East 700 and East 800 block, and there's several residential properties just south there. The commercial properties on Atlantic Avenue notably include tenants such as Illustrated Properties, Northern Trust, Deck 84, and the Blue Acre. We're talking about a real estate sales office, trust company, um, a bar that was reconstructed about 25 years ago, and another bar, uh, Deck 84, which has been in operation for about 15 years, and whose success has benefited from the redevelopment that they've been allowed 
Um, we oppose Ordinance 26-23 because it fails in its application of the city's regulations to the proposed area. Um, the criteria is very clear. Uh, the City of Delray Beach Land Development Regulations 4.51, B2, and B3 set forth a criteria for designating a historic district. It's, um, you know, does the questions here in the analysis says, does the district, does the proposed district exemplify in a significant way the activities of a major important person? Um, is, the part, is this part of a historic event? Was there anything associated with a past or continuing institution which has contributed substantially to the life of the city? Um, subsection B3 of that regulation says, does the criteria, you know, ask whether there's an architectural or aesthetic significance? Okay. My client's property does not meet this criteria set forth in B2 and B3, which is necessary to qualify for a historic designation. As the area is not associated with significant people, historical events, or associated with an institution that has significantly contributed to the life of the city. Also, the architecture of my client's property is not consistent with an area of the town's history. The method and elements of construction are not innovative or an adaptation to the South Florida environment. These are necessary elements in our code. Um, when I was listening to the presentation of the staff, it was helpful, it was interesting, but I disagree with the economic benefits that come with curtailing redevelopment versus allowing redevelopment within the current zoning map. And just because a building's old doesn't mean it qualifies for the necessary criteria that we have in place. Um, there's no sacred battlefields on Atlantic Avenue. Um, I didn't hear the names of important people that, tie, that are tied to the area in question. I listened to the owner's incentives and respectfully, no thank you. I disagree with the historic presentation has economic benefits to the owner, better than what they already have. Okay. If an owner wants this designation, well, they can apply for it. Okay. Maintaining grandfathering is not always safe. Um, and the review process, of course, is going to be simple because no one's going to be able to get work done. Um, we pose it. The implications are going to set the city back while other cities expand. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Mr. Stevens, I'm, I'm going to miss your address, if you don't mind repeating your sure. address again. Sure. Okay, yeah, sure. My address... Uh, my work address is 2300 Northwest Corporate Boulevard, Suite 215 in Boca Raton. Thanks. Hi, my name is Hillary Roach. Um, business address 525 East Atlantic Ave. Uh, recent property in Delray, 1037 Brooks Lane. I represent, I'm speaking as an owner of the Colony Hotel. I didn't take notes because I wanted to listen to the presentation. I'm someone who's trying to preserve a historic building in Delray. And what I wanted to hear today was a little bit more about the regulations and the restrictions placed on a historic business. I'm very frustrated trying to get some things done to save this building. No one loves this building more than my cousin Justina and I. We've been in permit for three years to have three front awnings on our hotel replaced. Excuse me, <laughs> I'm not a good public speaker. And we can't seem to do that, even after sending decades of photos, how they were represented. We're working on another project right now, and I found just this week that the southeast corner of our hotel is not in compliance with the new regulations of Delray. So if we ever want to do anything of significant change to our property, that that front corner is no longer in compliance. So we will have to find another way through additional bargaining with the city to make changes. So I do support the historic district, but I wanna know what you're gonna do to help me stay in business, to help me paint my hotel, to help me look good, because I don't look good. Code enforcement started fining us for dirty awnings. I don't want to have dirty awnings. I want to have clean awnings. I want to be the gem of Atlantic Ave. And so I support this, but I need you to support me and help me run this business. I think that the ordinance is very broad. I think it gives the city a lot of power. And I don't know what it gives me. I don't need tax incentives. I need new awnings. Thank you. Thank you. 
George Long, 46 North Swinton. Speaking of economic benefits, I've heard a lot of people at some of these commission meetings saying the thing that brings people to Delray is because it looks like it does. We don't have these big tall buildings and stuff all over. We gotta, we gotta keep it like this. I was um, incidentally driving from the beach, the Atlantic Avenue, coming over the bridge, and I looked at the Atlantic Avenue, looked down the Atlantic Avenue, Avenue, and I thought, well, what is so special about this? What are we talking about here? And it's obvious. You have trees and you have sky up there that you can see. It's not like walking down uh, Los Olas in, in Fort Lauderdale. That, that's what it's all about. The, the whole visual impact all together, the impression. That's why these people are coming to town. And that's why we have these rules. I mean, why we're working on the, all these regulations, keeping stuff, the buildings down to, to three, three stories instead of four. And I agree, I guess he's not here now, but um, um, anyway, the point is we need to keep Delray more of a village and don't let it, let it, let it grow out of hand. And if making that area a historic district helps do that, we should do it for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, hi, Claudia Willis, 42 Palm Square in the Marina Historic District. I have a bunch of disjointed notes from what's been going on tonight, so I'm just gonna comment on them. And I would like to ask uh, Mr. Heisenbottle and Michelle to answer some of the questions that people have posed tonight, particularly about the value of historic uh, uh, properties bring to tourism. Um, Everyone's concerned about more regulation, but every area of the city has regulation. I mean, the worst thing is your homeowners <laughs> association. They really have the heaviest regulation. Um, Mr. Wynan was talking about don't bring in more government, uh, and I guess from government, he means more regulations. Uh, as Michelle pointed out, it's actually going to be streamlined to one board instead of two boards. Um, but I say, I have had 10 properties in the historic district. I have to be honest, they were all residential, but with the exception of my own home, uh, they were all, um, if, if they were not commercial, but they were, uh, you know, financially I benefited from them. So, um, I never had a problem with the rules because I always got the vision. And Delray has a vision, and it was a vision that has been established over the years by our predecessors. It's that vision that made people come to Delray to invest. Uh, I mean, a lot of these investors that are here now must have loved what they saw, this human scale downtown. And certainly all of our awards that we get are about being a human scale historic town. Um, I wanna speak also, I, I would like to make sure that we ask for the national designation as well because I think I'm the only person that benefited from the IRS federal tax, uh, uh, re, uh, not rebate, it's dollar for dollar against your taxes when you do improvements on your properties, which every time a property switches over on Delray, they're doing a million dollar improvement. And yet, yes, it's a process to fill out the forms for it, but so is getting a mortgage. Uh, you know, everything is a process. It, it's a huge benefit for all of those investment properties on Atlantic Avenue. If you wanna know about benefits, that's one in the pocketbook. Um, also in, in talking about losing a, a, a height or whatever, Let's be honest, these buildings are lot line to lot line and they have no parking. And if you go to change these buildings, you're gonna have to change to the new codes. What are you gonna use for parking? You, you know, it's, it needs to be looked at for all of the facts. Um, and let's see if there's somebody else. Sorry, I needed. Claudia, you've hit your time. Oh, I did. Okay, thank you. You did. <laughs> thank you.
Okay, any further public comment? So, Rebuttal from staff? Yeah, so I, we were all taking feverish notes. Um, I'm, I'm going to start off, I think, on just a general, there were some specific questions that I, I think Mr. Heisenbaum or Michelle will answer, but I did want to speak to the issue that was raised over and over again about property rights. There is nothing in this ordinance that is changing your zoning and the uses that you can use your property for. Um, quite honestly, um, if you were to go through the SPRAB process for these buildings, it's a little different than the, the single family neighborhoods that you frequently see as a board. Um, buildings in the central business district are subject to design guidelines that are purposely quite broad because they're capturing a wide range of styles. So the Mediterranean revival style that's in the CBD design guidelines that all properties are subject to in downtown gives a pretty wide definition of those types of styles. It encompasses everything from the more sober mission to the more ornate, you know, um, Meisner-esque execution. So when you shift to historic preservation, the period of significance in the style is more, um, I think, defined for those properties, um, which in some ways makes the expectations more predictable in a way. Um, but it doesn't change the fact that you're bringing in a, a building that is subject to a design guideline review by a board. It's the same. It doesn't change um, your, um, if you were to uh, build under the new code, um, to I, I think um, some of the comments, um, the setbacks are drastically different than what is on the ground right now for the historic properties, many of which are built to a zero setback. Um, the new code would require 10-foot setbacks on all sides facing streets and another rear setback that is not in play right now. Um, those properties, when there was some discussion in staff's presentation about being vested for parking, um, if you start all over, we're assessing you those 12 per thousand for restaurant uses. So, you know, I don't know that um, the idea that any, that you, there is no, no way that I think the city attorney's office is going to let anything go through that is taking or removing a property right. It's, it's shifting the process uh, to the review of the properties with an eye towards preservation and towards reinforcing the character that is on the street now that has made Delray Delray and not Boynton Beach and not Boca. With all due respect to our neighbors, we are different. And um, that is part of the success that's been cultivated here. And there's an interest in this community that has been stated over and over again to, pr to protect that. And we can do that without affecting private property rights. Um, so um, that I would just sort of generally state. Um, there are incentives. And while you know, the federal tax credit may be daunting, um, we are able to program the new review process to accelerate projects. The projects that will be accelerated automatically are anything bringing in um, affordable housing, historic preservation projects. Those are the two that will go to the top of every reviewer's desk. Um, the project, uh, this new software, we had a soft open. Everything for building permits is available right now. We're all learning on both sides, so we haven't made a, a big to-do about it yet. Um, but we do have that technology um, that we can finally use to provide a tool. So um, the in-lieu parking, the city commission did pass a zoning in progress to pause all applications in downtown. There is one more left on the next agenda that is requesting 31 spaces for an adaptive reuse of a building. Now that'll have its own quasi-judicial hearing, but ultimately we're regrouping on in-lieu not just the fees, but in the application of it. And, and you know, the uh, comments that we've made and had positive feedback for is that this project can't, this program can't go away for historic properties. And if you can't park it here, you're not going to be able to build it. So I would just put forward that the incentives are quite, quite, um, quite significant, even if they don't appear so. I know everyone gets nervous. They have a right to protect their properties. We want to be partners with them. They're skin, the most wealth any of us have is our own properties, right? So um, this just really is an effort to um, reinforce the value collectively downtown. It's, and it's certainly not to remove what's already making everybody's property great. So um, 
that's the general, I think that is what came out of the gate. Um, there were other more specific properties. I think some of the people that commented don't realize they're already in Marina District, so there's some phone calls maybe we need to make after this to, to clarify some things, but, um, you know, I, I think, uh, I don't know how you want to go through. I took notes, you took notes. I wrote Rich's name next to some related to um, the level of government regulation and the specific critique as to whether or not the report um, identified um, you know, with all the styles that were identified and um, not having cohesion, why it would rise to a district. And I was wondering if, if maybe you could handle that response. Let's, let's, let's before I do that, um, let me let, oh, you, no, before I, before I respond at all, uh, let's let Michelle make her comments. Well, I mean, we technically are in a period of rebuttal, correct? Mm -hmm. um, there was, and I, I don't know in this instance, do I specifically well, know what I'm rebutting? It's not quasi-judicial, so this really isn't rebuttal okay. in, the, in the traditional sense. Staff is just addressing comments for the okay. benefit of board discussion. Okay, so I think my number one comment was um, there was a member of the public who spoke in opposition um, going through the requirements of the code saying that it failed in the application of the code, which I inherently disagree with on the record. Um, but I think it would be important that we reach out to that individual because the property that, if I understand the parameters and boundary of the property he's representing and was speaking on, he's already, that property's already in a historic district, which is the Marina Historic District. So this wouldn't um, overlay any new regulations that aren't already in place. So. I know that property, I think, was um, maybe formerly owned by Mr. Handelsman or still is or has traded hands. I'm not sure. But we clearly need to have a conversation. Um, I also understand the, the comments, um, while I'm appreciative of the support comments from um, Ms. Roche at the Colony, there definitely is some work. And I was thinking about her project today. Um, issues with awnings and how that's being handled is predominantly an issue with the fact that there's state right of way there. It's not a relation to a historic code. Um, so I just wanted to be clear that whether they were in a historic district or not, that issue is existing. Um, but as we were sitting, I was thinking about, are there some programs that could potentially support um, their organization, their business, and how can we perhaps bring them together? But she also um, said she wanted to hear about the regulations. And I don't have a presentation that has the entire regulations, but for the purpose of the folks sitting here tonight, I encourage them to go to delraybeachfl.gov forward slash historic. And our historic pages are very well curated. We've worked with feedback from the community. Um, there is a link on the left that says regulations and maps that can be clicked on. The governing section for any property in a historic district is LDR section 4.5.1. Um, so I encourage folks to look at what those regulations are. But duly noted, and I think is moving forward for future presentations as we go through the public hearing process, we are certainly going to add a slide or two um, about some of the base regulations because the most important regulations are visual compatibility, which I think I just barely touched on today. Um, also from our uh, first you know, commenter, I think Anthea covered um, things that I wanted to talk about which was in relation to property rights and there's very specific case law. I can't speak to what it is because I'm not an attorney, but I have researched it and listened to presentations about how case law affects private property rights for people in historic districts. Um, that's going to have to be something that uh, we have further discussion on, um, but I just want to be clear that um, let's not misstate the facts um, because these properties are not having a zoning change happening. Um, there, I have a lot of other notes. I, yeah, I was surprised um, that out of the 10, 
people who came to speak tonight that it was uh, a clear, from my understanding here, we had about four in opposition um, and six in support. So that's what I have for now. So ladies and gentlemen, um, let me first start off by, by, by saying that I was so completely impressed with staff's presentation tonight that I really need to compliment them and I think you should compliment them. It was incredibly professional in the way it was done. We've seen these many, many times before and you're very lucky to have staff uh, pr prepare so so well for, uh, for this presentation. So I, I hope everyone here uh, appreciates that. Um, I take, I take a great issue with some of the exaggerations that some legal counsel, probably sitting behind me right now, um, had with, with, with what this designation of a historic district will do. Um, uh, in particular, uh, Mr. Sweetapple's uh, comment that the, the schizophrenic village by the sea was a very inappropriate and, and, and simply out of place for a, a, a public hearing. Um, the property rights are not being taken away by this ordinance. This ordinance is the same as nearly every other historic district ordinance in the state of Florida. And, and traditionally, Every historic district in the state of Florida has, has gone on over the years to only enhance the beauty and the charm and all of those things that we like about the historic district, all of those things that w are the reasons why we want to go forward with designating this as, as a historic district. They have all, typically, not all, we can't say all, but certainly I can say all in the city of Miami, for example, uh, they have all in the city of Miami increased the property value tremendously over over a period of 10 to, to 20 years, tremendously. Um, and be, because of the cohesiveness that this, that this preservation related review brings, the review that you as a, as a team uh, uh, on the board do every month, um, brings to the design process of, of, of buildings in the historic district. They all have to meet a certain set of very basic standards. The Secretary of the Interior's standards are not rocket science. They're good common sense rules that, that, that I'm sure you've all learned as you sat here over, uh, listening to Michelle explain product after project, month after month. That they're good common sense rules for maintaining the integrity of historic buildings. And, and that's what this ordinance is, is really all about. It will maintain the integrity of the historic buildings that, that are on Atlantic Avenue. Uh, and, and I also uh, would uh, like to challenge two of the other uh, gentlemen that, that, that spoke. One, one gentleman, um, uh, Michael, uh, I'm not so sure I got his last name correct, so I'll leave it out, but um, who was generally anti-government regulation. Now, I'm not a big fan of government regulation. Well, probably none of us are big fans of government regulation. Um, but uh, what, what he liked about the city is the fact that it didn't look like a shopping plaza. Uh, and, and, that, and he didn't think that it needed government to do that. Well, I can show you examples within this historic district, and, and so can Michelle, um, where, where your review and, and, and approval of a project or disapproval of a project would have made a, a really, uh, would, have, would have helped tremendously uh, in saving a historic bank building in town, of, of which uh, Michelle probably knows which one I'm talking about, that was, that was altered so significantly uh, to suit the bank, I'm sure, uh, but uh, so that it is no longer even recognizable as a historic structure and not part of what we designated. Um, but, but had it matched, had it, had it been in the character of what was originally on that site, it would have been one of the buildings that we would be probably most proud of. So, so I'm afraid, to, to, to that gentleman's point, I'm afraid that it does take some level of government oversight. And that's what this public board is all about. 
to give it that, that oversight, that review, in accordance with some very basic, very simple guidelines and standards that, that in my view, are, are really more uh, architectural uh, and preservation common sense. Um, to make a blanket statement, uh, Council Stevens behind me, um, that this fails uh, in its application, that the property does not meet uh, the requirements of B2 and B3 and, and does not meet the criteria without giving any reason or any explanation to why his property does not, uh, it doesn't, you know, I think the argument doesn't make sense. If you're going to say that, then, under, then, then go out and, and show us why this particular property probably, or, or maybe, perhaps, uh, doesn't belong as one of the contributing properties in the district. Generally speaking, the, the, the ratio of contributing properties to non-contributing properties in this district makes it a very solid historic district. It, 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 meets, it meets the criteria. And, uh, it, and just to come out and say that it, that it fails is just a blanket statement without anything uh, to back it up. Um, I'm, I'm excited by the fact that we had so many folks that are in favor of supporting the historic district. Uh, I, like many of you, have um, enjoyed the, 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 the district, the walkability of the district, the history of the district for so many years with my, with my family living up here. My mother and father used to live in Delray. Uh, and, uh, and, and so uh, I think this this district will go a long way to assuring that, that the, the visual characteristics of the district, the integrity of the architecture of the district uh, will, will remain the same without destroying the property rights, the underlying property rights of all the property owners who, who we certainly re, um, respect and are, and are proud of the way they maintain these properties. So if you have any specific questions, I'll, I'll try to amplify, but, but hopefully I've um, I've given you something here. Any questions from the board? Or are we ready for board discussion? <clears throat> Jim, would you like to start us off? Um, I guess I have to say yes to that. Right? Uh, I started out tonight uh, and I had a, a bunch of specific questions which probably uh, seem right now not terribly important because we're really talking about the, the bigger, uh, bigger questions. I, I, just as an example, I was interested in why the original survey uh, cut off part of Atlantic Avenue to the east, east of, of the canal, because that, that wasn't mentioned. But uh, when I... Uh, I heard some of the uh, complaints. I wanted to go to, or some of the concerns. I wanted to go to um, bigger issues. Um, I, I heard Hillary speak about her frustrations with the Colony Hotel. And we all know what a precious asset that city is, or that, I'm sorry, that hotel is. It's iconic, it, it, it represents Delray, it's on our Christmas cards. And the, the problem that, that she addressed was really the process in Delray, which I think uh, Anthea has tried to talk about a little bit, that to take two years to get new awnings uh, is, is a real disincentive. But that's a process. That's not a historic preservation issue, I, I, I would argue. That's, there are other solutions for that. Um, I also heard something about the CRA made downtown. I can't think of one building on downtown that the CRA made, not one. Uh, they can't take credit for uh, anything with Old School Square. They can't take credit for anything in Peb Capital and Sunday Village. They can't take credit for Atlantic Crossing. The CRA does other things. They work in the neighborhoods primarily. Uh, they do streets, alleys, housing renovations, but they have not preserved our downtown. Our downtown has been preserved through the hard work of people like Linda Oxford's 
families, uh, people like Billy Himmelrich, who I don't know where he went. Uh, we have preserved a great little building on the corner of Fourth Avenue and Atlantic, the southwest corner, which when additional money and capital came into the city, wanted to make that look like it used to be when it was built. So there's a, an architect here sh who shall go nameless that designed a beautiful little building to maintain the historic context of, of the street. And I think that's the sort of thing that really keeps Atlantic Avenue uh, the way it is. I think the other thing that, that really struck me is parking. Um, and setbacks, of course, are an issue too, but if we all of a sudden had to park those buildings that are on Atlantic Avenue, you know what we would have? We'd have a bunch of parking spaces, uh, kind of like uh, uh, Northeast Third Avenue has had to do in order to liven that up. Um, or we'd have to go underground, like Peb Capital has had to do with Sunday Village. Uh, and I think an, an example of that is the Delray Market. I've heard that called a parking garage with a shopping center underneath it. Three stories in order to, to park that building. And the last, the last thing, I'll, and I'll, then I'll get off my uh, podium here. Uh, I think walkability is really important, and that's, I think that's why people come here. People, at, at least in my understanding, don't go to malls on Friday nights and walk around. They do in, in, on Atlantic Canada. And that's what we're trying to preserve. We're not trying to preserve buildings, per se. We're trying to build, preserve the walkability, the neighborliness, uh, the ability to walk down the street and see your friends and neighbors in a, in a, in a restaurant. So it's not trying to preserve uh, a particular architectural style, at least in my mind, it's to preserve what Delray is. And there's a lot of Delray that's no longer the village by the sea. The village by the sea still exists downtown and it's what makes Delray Delray and makes it an exceptional city. Uh, and <laughs> I'm obviously going to vote for this. I'll go. Um, quick question for staff. So I noticed that the two large parcels to the west of Veterans Park <clears throat> are included in the staff recommendations, but on the uh, report, they were recommended to be uh, not included. Just want to know what was it just to keep the consistency? I want to take a moment to look at the map. They're not included. They're not. Okay, so yeah. they were excluded. All yeah. right, they were highlighted. So they were highlighted because right, they I were yep. they were looked at um, at the time. The consultant studied the area. Atlantic Crossing was coming out of the ground, um, but the parcel to the east was still very much in operation where Chico's and the bank, you know, Merrill Lynch and all that is. Uh, so we had a conversation about it and I explained that that was going to be demolished and another construction project. So they studied it, which is why it was noted as blue, but it's not within the boundary. All right, yeah, it was in the staff report on the first page. So that showed it being included. So I just wanna make you're right. This we'll image. have to correct that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, John. All right. Um, I will say too that there was a um, comment from, I think it was commission at the commission point when they were looking at this um, about the okay these properties here, which on the right is the colony, and then this one right here. Uh, which was the old Bethesda bargain box. The report that the consultant did had the line going through the parking lot and the commission said, why wouldn't, it's a unified site, like it's one parcel, why wouldn't it be included? So we extended 
um, talked with the consultant and the boundary was extended um, to include the whole parcel. So we weren't splitting their parcel in half, making it confusing that if it became a district, half of it's in, half of it's out. And the same is the case for the backside of the colony, which does have one small building there and a parking lot. So the boundary was extended around those two. But you're correct, the report map should not include the Atlantic Crossing parcels. We will have to correct that before it moves on. Okay, thank you. But um, the legal description that's attached to the ordinance does not does okay. not include it. So it's a graphical error on my part. All right, no problem. Yeah, that legal description was very long and very detailed. And yes, I didn't get it was. Every <laughs> single one of those. Um, so Delray, you know, everybody say Delray is unique, and it is. Delray was developed before automobiles. Model T came out in 1909. So when people moved here, they walked or they rode horses or something of that nature. Uh, it was developed before electricity. So the fact that downtown Delray, you know, yes, some of the buildings have changed. Um, the uses have certainly changed, but the infrastructure, the street grids, the feel, the scale is very similar that it, it, it's been in decades, decades and decades. Um, you know, I say that the, the, the best thing that ever happened to Delray is Boca. So in, uh, you know, the 60s and 70s, money flooded out of Delray. Everybody went to Boca, even in the 80s. Uh, Boca blew up, obviously a much larger geographic area, twice what Delray is. Um, but Delray was still small, sleepy little Delray, and, and, and until it was rediscovered, you know, 20, 25, 30 years ago, uh, thanks to the part of historic designation and our uh, recovery and saving of Old School Square and Francis Bork and, and the whole group there, and, um, you know, the fact that that initiated it, and the CRA did play a role, um, but the fact is Delray has a very invested and uh, interested and included uh, populace. And there's many people here that have lived here for a long time. And the reason why new people come here is because of the scale and the feel and the vibe and the nightlife that Atlantic Avenue has turned into. And, you know, you go back 30 years and there was Elwood's. Um, you know, that was probably one of the starts of it. And then there were Splendid Blendeds and 32 East, and it grew from there and it blew up. So a lot of people that have moved into town recently and view these as strictly dollars and cents and investments, that's not going anywhere. But they're here for a reason. That's because Delray is popular. Um, the fact that this has not been done 20 years ago is somewhat disappointing. Um, I think when the dollars get really high and the property values increase exponentially, it becomes much harder to do this type of thing. So I applaud the city for doing it. Um, you know, changes are possible. Uh, I think the scare tactic is that you're gonna put a bubble over this and that nothing could ever be done ever again. And that is not the case. We approve variances almost every meeting there are changes approved almost every meeting. Well, there are changes approved every meeting or you wouldn't need a board. Um, they took a nationally recognized full city block in block 61 and dug the whole thing up, removed every tree, moved around every building. So you can't tell me that things cannot happen in a historic district. I was not a fan of that, but there was a process for that to happen, and it did happen, and it's happening right now. So, you know, I understand the nostalgia from one side, I understand the, the business aspects and the dollars and cents and the financial interests on the other side, but I also think of this as a resident and somebody who, you know, grew up in this town, um, it has to be livable and walkable and enjoyable for the residents here, and that's who this is for. It's the residents who created the comprehensive plan that put this language in there 
that was so strong for historic preservation. That was made up, and I, I'll be honest, I was on that board. And I was happy to serve and humbled to serve on that board. And Jim, you were on there as well. And um, it was very important to the members of this, uh, the public who were working on that board and that committee looking forward. Um, I understand Hillary's frustration and I've had conversations with Hillary on this too and I would, I would recommend that somebody from the city needs to figure that out like yesterday because the, the gem and the um, you know, shining star in the, our downtown area is having a tough time getting stuff figured out and, and if there's one thing that scares people and gives historic preservation a bad name, it's that type of an issue, whether it's a historic preservation issue or not. Um, but I think we need to you know, hold the hands of some of these property owners downtown who are coming through and maybe don't understand the process or are caught in some catch-22 and we need to definitely help them out. Um, you know, I've got a lot of other notes and comments on here, but I'm wholeheartedly in support of this and, um, you know, ready to make a motion when anybody else is. So. <laughs> Any other comments? I have a few questions. Has the public reached out to staff with, with questions before this meeting? I've received one email with questions. Just one? Okay. Aside from... That's to my team directly. I don't know if there have been right. communications with legal um, or commissioners or other folks um, about the district. Mm -hmm. so I, I can confirm that one of the people or one of the properties that had a lawyer here to speak on their behalf today um, wrote a letter to the city attorney's office, I think a couple of months ago when the, when the original report was um, presented, objecting. Um, but aside from that communication, I personally haven't received anything more than Michelle has. Okay, so not too much. No, which was surprising. I was wondering, you, you mentioned, Mr. Um, Heisenbottle, that, and, and the, all, all, I want to say the three presentations were, were great by staff. I really enjoyed that. Um, you mentioned in Miami there were some successful downtown historic districts. Could there you? Were successful historic districts, period, across the board. Every, every, um, any number of historic districts have all been very, every one of the historic districts in Miami has been very successful. They're not. There is a downtown historic district. It happens to be a, a National Register historic district. Um, and which one is that? Uh, the, no, that's, that, it is called the downtown historic district. Oh, down to downtown <laughs> Miami. <laughs> that's pretty, and it is the main street in town, Flagler Street. Mm -hmm. And there are I know, dozens of, uh, and, and upon dozens of historic buildings on the street that are, that are all critically important. Um, street going through a major change right now with a completely new streetscape. Uh, and infrastructure, you know, all the infrastructure is, is uh, it was from, you know, the turn of the cent of, of the last century, uh, and and so literally the whole street is being redone, or literally as we speak, they're digging it up now. Mm -hmm. But the activity in in the district is is excellent, um, but less pride in in that district because it is so in cha in the period of change. Um, the other historic districts have all been successful. They, they are, they do enhance uh, the quality of life in those districts. They, they do enhance the property values in those districts. Mm -hmm. Is Miracle Mile one of those? Miracle Mile's in the city of Coral Gables. Okay. Uh, and, and, and yes, Miracle Mile is, is uh, certainly a, um, successful, but that's not one of the ones that I was e even considering. Okay. I'm in support of, of this. Um, I think that, you know, I'm, I am sensitive to property owners and them losing some, you know, them, you know not having them not lose too much control, but I do think the big picture is to actually enhance their property, and I think this does that. Um, I think that's taking the big picture. It doesn't seem like they'll lose too much. Um, 
in the way of the process of getting projects done. They used to go to SPRAB, and now that they wouldn't have to anymore, correct? They would just come to, to the HPB? Correct. Okay, so it seems like it's just shifting a little bit of the, the process, but it's not so much different. Um, no, I'm in support of the, of the bill, and I, I'll put that out there. Um, I'll jump in. Um, again, staff, thank you very much for a great presentation. The uh, cer certain terms come to mind. Uh, I'll bring them up. Scale, proportion, landscape canopy, streetscape, walkability, human scale. And all, I think all those define Atlantic Avenue. And, I, and I'm support, in support to, to make sure that that avenue remains the way it is, and I think uh, declaring it a historic district is the way to do it. You know, this this seems very similar to when I was attending the School of Architecture. A uh, uh, lady by the name of Barbara Capitman was um, tying herself to Art Deco buildings, and uh, and people were going to tear it down. And this is and, Miami Beach. He's talking about. And right now, now, and now it's the pride of Miami Beach, right? It, so it, it is the pride of Miami Beach, yeah. among uh, lots of other historic districts, by the way. So it reminds me of that. Yeah. But I'm in support of this. I'd like to also uh, thank staff. This was a wonderful presentation. It's been a long time coming. I've served on this board um, for a little over 20 years off and on. So to finally see that, it, that our main street, the, the hub of our town has really evolved and to see that we, as a community, we want to preserve the history that's currently there. It doesn't mean that the properties can't evolve. Um, I think that the historic designation of Atlantic Avenue and the establishment of a special district for this area, it helps us maintain the human scale of our town. It helps us maintain the walkability. It maintains the overall quote unquote effect that Delray feels like when you walk into it. And I think it also helps us maintain the uniqueness that comes from individual property ownership. Um, I don't know if I can explain myself, but when properties become united on a streetscape and one owner has it all, when that property becomes developed, they create something like we're seeing at Atlantic Crossing where it all kind of blends together and melds together. And um, it's a different feel than a property that was built in the 20s, next to a property that was built in the 60s, next to a property that's owned by a woman, next to a property that's owned by um, you know, a, a family versus an individual or a corporation. All of those things have gone into what makes the streetscape of Atlantic Avenue very unique to Atlantic Avenue. And I'm hoping that this historic designation will help us maintain that individual ownership where there's continued pride in each individual property by the owners. And I'm very much in favor of this designation. Um, yeah, I was taking notes, and the one thing that I starred here in my little book was the fact that none of the zoning is going to change for any of these properties. I think that's really, really important because, um, you know, you're still going to have to go to approve through approval process, you know, whenever you want to do anything. And to me, the review process being more streamlined. Um, and Thea, I think you mentioned affordable housing and historic preservation will go to the top of the list for receiving permits and getting things done. Um, you know, my husband and I bought in Delray 19 years ago in historic district and we bought because 
we, I, we, I fell in love with Delray. I had a house in Fort Lauderdale at the time. Um, he already had a house here. And seriously, the walking, we bought off George Bush, which is eight blocks from the Ave. And when we had our daughter, my thought process was, oh, we'll walk to downtown. Well, we didn't have sidewalks down Second Avenue. So um, Susan Ruby, former city attorney, um, she lived on the corner there. And we formed a little committee in Delia Park in her living room. And we um, got a grant from the city. It took, I believe, eight years to get the sidewalks in. So by the time my daughter was eight, I, I wasn't strolling her down Atlantic Avenue. But we could use a bike path. So we biked to Atlantic Avenue. My point is the people that live in Delray, work here, enjoy Delray, we don't want to see like you said, become a different city. We are unique. Um, we're not schizophrenic. Um, you can have different architectural styles. You can have different things that compromise and make the city beautiful. Um, I respect all the people that own buildings and properties on Atlantic Avenue. I still think that they'll be able to uh, do the things like John was saying, uh, Sunday Village. We were here, I think, till two o'clock in the morning for that city commission meeting. Uh, we were opposed to it, but it was, now it's being done the right way. And I think that's what I see with this historic designation is that things will come before, before the city and they'll be done you know, in the right way. It, there's, there's always gonna be a process. There's always gonna be government oversight. As um, my grandmother always said, there's always death and taxes. So, um, you know, if we can do this, the review process being more streamlined, the property owners know that um, there are a lot of incentives. Um, I think they're ill-informed of what those are, then I'm, I'm definitely in favor of this. One quick comment. One more quick comment, too, about five, six years ago, maybe even a little bit longer, uh, I was at the Historical Society and, and Winnie and I were doing a presentation to um, a group of realtors and probably 30 people in the room. I think it was Douglas Elman. I can't remember it, but it was a large group. And um, one of the things that I had talked about at the time was the need for an Atlantic Avenue Historic District or whatever it would be called. And the realtors applauded. Everybody loved the idea. And realtors, Kristen, get a bad name. You know, they're just in it for the transaction. But I think a lot of people understand that Delray is unique. That's why people come here. That's why it commands a much higher per square foot value than pretty much anywhere else in South Florida, other than some maybe really large urban areas. So I don't think it's going to hurt anybody. I think it's going to help secure this town. For the for the foreseeable future so that's it may i add one more thing uh, we keep talking about the benefits to the downtown but i would make an argument that the most benefits are in the areas surrounding downtown that's where a sofa has come in that's where uh, young couples or young families can have a live, work, play environment because they can live off the Ave but still spend time on it. That's why Kristen came here, because, and she's eight blocks away. So we have to make sure that we see that there are these sort of tertiary effects that, that are also impacted by this, not just Atlantic Avenue. Yeah, um, I'd like to make a motion. Go. All right. Um, I would like to recommend approval to the City Commission of Ordinance Number 26-23, amending Section 4.5.1, Local Register of Historic Places, of the Land Development Regulations for the Historic Designation of the Atlantic Avenue Historic District, by finding that the amendment and approval thereof is consistent with the comprehensive plan and meets the criteria set forth in the land development regulations. I'd like to second that. And Secretary, if we could call the roll. 
Ivan Heredia? Yes. Kristen Finn? Yes. Rhonda Saxton? Yes. John Miller? Yes. Jim Chard? Yes. Chris Cabeza? Yes. Elise Lindstrom? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to queue up the next item's um, application and presentation. Fantastic. Do you want us to take a few minutes break or we're ready to proceed? Well, I don't know if the entire audience is staying, so maybe we take a five minute break to allow for the, the shift, shift that may occur, yeah. yeah. Madam Secretary, is that all right with you? Take five.
Hey. I'm on. Oh, now I'm there on. There we go. <laughs> I swear I pushed the button. Okay. So uh, first, let's read the rules. This hearing shall be conducted in accordance with the city of Delray Beach quasi-judicial rules. The applicant and the city shall be permitted to present their case. The public shall be allowed to speak for three minutes each or a maximum of six minutes if the person represents an organization or a group of people who are present but agree not to speak. The city commission, board members, staff, and the applicant may be allowed to cross-examine a witness. The city or the applicant will be allowed to offer rebuttal testimony. The decision to approve or deny an application or appeal may not legally be made upon personal views as to whether the project is a good project or not, nor may a decision be based on the number of citizens who support or oppose a particular project. The law requires that all decisions must be made on the basis of whether the project meets the requirements of law, the comprehensive plan, and the land development regulations. All right, so if we could please have the staff read in uh, 9A, Certificate of Appropriateness 2023-158. For the record, I'm Michelle Hewitt, and I'd like to read into the record agenda item 9A for 321 North Swinton Avenue, Certificate of Appropriateness 2023-158. The homeowner's agent is here to present. Hi, good evening. My name is Mateo Encinosa, representing Tom Sedita at 321 North Swinton Avenue. Um, we're looking to remove the existing six-foot wood fencing that you can see in this photo at the front. Uh, uh, sorry, just very quickly, you were sworn in, correct? I was. Okay, thank you. Alrighty. So we're looking to replace the existing six foot tall uh, wood fencing that currently sits uh, 24 feet from the sidewalk um, with a masonry wall matching the stucco finish of the house uh, and painting it to match as well. So it looks cohesive with the architecture of the home. Um, not looking to change any placement of anything, just replace in the exact same location. Uh, as you can see, this is the current fence along the front and the north side is where we propose the um, masonry wall. Stucco painted to match the house, exact same location as the existing fence. Here are some of the concept renders uh, for the wall, just replacing it exactly like it is um, and going from there. Along the back side, uh, looking to replace the back fence with a composite wood fencing. Um, as opposed to uh, standard you know, pine wood fencing. And there's also photos of other areas along the back uh, alleyway that are a little bit more run down. We're just looking to uh, improve upon uh, that area there with something that will not need to be replaced as often. And that's it. While staff is getting ready, can I ask for any ex parte communication? Jim, would you start us off? None. 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 Yes, I spoke to Tom Sidita probably three, four months ago uh, at a non related event, and he said that he was coming before the board, and this is what it was about. None. Um, okay, so once again, this is for 321 North Swinton Avenue, uh, COA 2023-158. Um, this is a request for the installation of a synthetic fence associated with an existing contributing single family residence. Here we have a aerial of the property um, or outlined in red. Uh, this property is adjacent or along North Swinton Avenue to the west, um, and there's an alley in the rear. Some background, um, this is uh, a contributing property within the Old School Square Historic Arts District uh, zoning, and it's within the locally and nationally designated Old School Square Historic District. The two-story house is a fine example of Mediterranean Revival architecture with mission-style elements. The exterior massing of the main residence is irregular and has flat roofs together with shaped, shaped parapet walls. The two-story section of the home has a hipped roof with a jigsaw and exposed rafter tails. The chimney has a parabolic chimney cap, and the entrance to the home occurs at the side of the enclosed porch adjacent to the portico share south elevation. 
Here we have an image of the front or west side of the structure um, from the other side of a fence where you can see um, some of the textures and colors of the subject property. This is the rear or uh, the rear side of the structure um, where you can see the existing wood fencing. Uh, this area here is proposed to be replaced with the composite fencing. Uh, here we can see the uh, side of the structure um, and you can see, again, some of the fencing along the rear as well. Here we have the another side of the uh, structure from a different angle. Again, you can see some of the existing wood fencing as well. Um, here we have the other side on the south um, elevation here. Um, you can see some of the different types of fencing that exist around, as well as the structure. And then here we have a uh, rear elevation from looking inside from the property um, at the fencing. And then here we have the front elevation from the interior uh, looking along North Swinton Avenue. Here is some adjacent fencing that currently exists in the area. So here we have the existing site plan. Uh, everything in blue is the fencing. Right now everything's um, six foot wood fencing. And the applicant is proposing to do a four foot masonry wall um, with an aluminum gate on the west and then a six foot masonry wall um, along the rest of the uh, portion of the fencing or the wall that is uh, outside of the front setback. And then along the north, the a six foot masonry wall will continue along. And then there in the rear is where the synthetic material is proposed at six feet. Here is a proposed rendering where you can see the lower front four foot uh, masonry wall with the gate and then the higher six feet, which is recessed back behind the front setback. And you can see some of the fencing along the side as well. Uh, here is an image of the proposed synthetic fencing, um, which the agent kind of went into. Uh, here we have an excerpt from the Secretary of the Interior Standards. Um, there is no concern regarding the use of masonry as that is considered an appropriate material for not only this architectural style, but historic sites in general. There is concern, however, regarding the use of synthetic materials it is, as it is not considered an appropriate material in historic districts within Delray Beach. Here we have um, some excerpts from the, for visual compatibility. Um, the consideration can be given to using authentic materials in the front and sides of the property or visible from the public right of way and use of other materials for the rear or portions of the property not visible from the public right of way. Here are sections highlighted from the Secretary of the Interior Standards for Rehabilitation that were used to analyze this uh, request. Um, and then the item utilized in the visual compatibility standards to analyze this request. Here are the findings that staff and the board uses um, when analyzing um, the request. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you, any public comment? All right, any rebuttal or cross-examination from the applicant, from staff? And from staff. Fantastic, board discussion. I think the first thing that comes to my mind is the, uh, the masonry wall is very fitting and seems like a great idea. And the, uh, oh, I guess I do have a question for staff. The um, composite fencing, can it be seen from the right of way? Can it be seen from the front of the property at all? Um, to my knowledge, I don't believe so. There is an alley which has vehicle access, sure. but um, from the front, the fencing is proposed to be the same height, um, the six foot in the front with the masonry and six foot in the height with the PVC or the okay. synthetic. Mm -hmm. And can I ask the same of the applicant, to your knowledge? So it's would not we be a able corner lot, so you wouldn't be able to see it uh, like driving by on either of the side uh, access streets. That's not the alleyway. Uh, and from the front, uh, that proposed wall would cover everything, so you wouldn't really be able to see back there. OK. So that's kind of been something that has come to us in the past. And if it can't be seen from a right of way, we're a little more forgiving. and. I think the the uh, the masonry wall seems very fitting. Other thoughts? Yes, I'm confused. I think in your presentation you mentioned that you were going to use treks, or it showed on a presentation. Right. So. Um, Which is not PVC. Right. So originally we had proposed to put in the white PVC fencing out back, 
Um, but then uh, Tom came up with the idea of using this Trek synthetic uh, wood instead, since it has a more wood-like look and doesn't show out as much as the white PVC. So well, in my mind, that makes a big difference. Right, and so then our present, our uh, actual proposal is now for the synthetic wood, the truck fencing. Right. So Michelle, uh, excuse me. So I'm apologize, board member. Um, just want to confirm, Michelle, is that part of the actual submitted application, or that's a modification that's being presented today? I believe a modification is being presented. Um, it was listed as a PVC in the application, but I believe yes, that it's been changed since then yeah do we have the specifications on the material and colors yes he sent them over not i think last week i'll have to check my email do we have a sample a physical sample a sample of the composition oh well this is um all that they gave us is there a particular color oh, that same color right there mm. Do you know that its name, or do you have that access to the email to see? Well, he said just it's Trex here. He yeah, if it's a specific sure. model number or color number or something like that, it's just something we can hold you to it down the road. No, absolutely. Yeah, let me pull that up. I like that idea much better than the white PVC. Uh, the white PVC, I had, yeah, I was, I was. I was right to say. You know, and, and I mean, this is a much better alternative to that, I think. And especially it's in the back right away. It's got to be 100 feet from Swinton at least. Mm -hmm. So I think the board's been pretty clear on white PVC in the past. So, yeah. You know, it, it, it would be good to see samples, though. It is woodland brown as the specific tricks. If, if he sent it over, though, a week ago, I don't want to force him to come back if it's in staff email or something like that. If if they're representing that this is the actual color or. Yeah, that is the woodland brown exact color right there. Does that have any grain to it? It does. It's more of a texture grain than an actual like color change grain. It's one solid color uh, with texture to it. I have a comment about the uh the actual wall. Um, can you can you bring up a picture of the structure itself? The house. Uh, right back to the images. You see how the ends kind of curl up. Like, okay, you have the parapet wall and then the ends kind of curl up. Can we, can we kind of mimic that? Is it too much to ask to mimic that as maybe at the end of the walls, just to add a little bit of more detail instead of just being flat? What, you know, what do you think about that? I, from what I understood, and correct me if I'm wrong, staff, the, the issue was this is a six foot wall as it is. So it would go up higher than six feet, which I think staff didn't approve of or? Um, so it? they just, the six feet, they can do six feet, but just not within the front setback. Um, so the fencing in the front here, I'll go to the site plan. Because it was gonna be six foot all the way across the front. And it's, it's there's no good image here of this house. It's a double lot. Mm -hmm. So the fencing closest to the North Swinton is supposed to be at four feet, which is within the front setback. And then that's been the part that's been recessed slightly is at six feet. And then all of that back there is six feet. And then the proposed synthetic fencing is to be at six feet as well. So you're so you're asking on the corners, it goes up another six inches just to create a little visual so. interest. So generally speaking, we try not to do what we refer to as design from the day is. Yeah, yeah. No. Um, right. You know, if, if the board finds that the proposed wall would be insufficient, absent details that match the building, and that discussion could be had and, and ask the applicant if they'd like to make that modification and come back. But it's, it's difficult to do certain things like that, especially as, as you see, we might have an amendment already uh, with a material and to try to, to designate staff to determine if the modification that's verbally being presented is executed properly is, is sometimes difficult. 
Understood. Thank you. Do we see the picture of the uh, masonry wall, the rendering again? It's proposed to be the same finish as that house, that rough. Mm -hmm. That same rough stucco finish to it, okay. the lace stucco. Is that column an existing feature that you're missing? That is, yep, that column exists. And then currently. the curved top of the forefoot, that's also existing? It is not existing. So that's a new... Right, to bring it down, feature. right, so to, to keep it at four feet closer to the gate, um, and then bring it back down to the three foot, which is where the uh, that existing structure we don't really have a picture of... And on our presentation, there should be on the first page. So it's okay to have a six-foot fence in the front yard? Not within the front setback. Oh, setback. So it, whatever, if it's 25 or 35 feet, whatever the setback is, then they can have a six-foot mm -hmm. fence. Mm -hmm. I see. Is six foot the max or can it go higher? It can go up to eight feet. Okay. I think it would be interesting to, to do what you, you were suggesting, maybe a little bit more detail, maybe on the other corner, but I'm not opposed to this. I think it works well. I think it's better than the wood fence that's existing. Mm -hmm. I'm just concerned that it contributes to the canyonization of North Swenton and sort of making these walled compounds uh, as you walk or bike up the street. I, I understand six feet on, on the side and in the back, but uh, even with the set, setback, how far does the setback have to be? I believe this one is 25 feet for this zoning. 25 feet from the, the property right line. From the property line. How tall is the um, existing wood fence in the front? Is that six foot? So in the front of the property, it could go eight feet? Like where it, on, the, on the east side? Outside of the set, on the east side? Like on the rear? Is that, is like where that, the PVC or the synthetic fencing is proposed? Well, on the, on the, on the left side where that's the oh, that's where you see it from Swinton. Yeah, anything right? that's not, if it's in the front setback, it can be taller than four feet. Everything can can go between or no taller than eight feet. Yeah. I'd say we take the six confusing? as a win and move on. I I completely agree with that statement, and um, the last thing I would want to do is take an applicant that has come up with I think a good answer that is fitting for the neighborhood and for the project itself and give them some kind of pushback where they need to come back to another meeting because we prefer a different style. That's, that's one of the things that we just discussed that we don't do as a board in quasi-judicial is that we go by what is appropriate and what is the law, not our personal preferences. Well, I, I agree with that, but we do have some flexibility about making sure. suggestions and would they consider and those sorts of things. But oh, uh, I, I agree with John's point. I, I would like to bring it up to staff. I mean, an eight-foot wall in front of your house? But they're well, not the, asking for an eight-foot wall, so yeah, don't encourage that. But they them. could. <laughs> they, uh, no, no, no. I'm just saying that uh, they could. Yeah, I'm no. confused why that is not a four-foot maximum on that side because it's facing Swinton. It right? would be that, if it was in the setback, if it was it's further, feet. but that's essentially no, no longer your front yard. It's, a, it's, it's basically a side yard. Mm -hmm. right. If you look at this house, it's a double lot and this is enclosing the side yard and there's parking between that wall and Swinton. But it's still facing Swinton. Mm -hmm. Correct. Sure. So is anybody else's side yard. Uh, that but they don't all so have six-foot walls in front of them. No, they could have eight. <laughs> Again, don't encourage it. Stop bringing it up. <laughs> I'd like to make a motion if there's no other comments. Uh, before the motion, the, the, uh, that six-foot masonry wall that's proposed there is to replace the existing six-foot uh, wall fence, but the current fence does sit at 24 feet and some change like a, an inch or two, mm -hmm. so it is slightly short of the 25 feet. That's the other thing. But your new wall will be the 25 feet, correct? 
if required to be. But we would prefer to put it a couple inches closer, but if 25 feet, I if think you we have a site plan technical item that. For, um, for that. <laughs> I just have to bring it up. I, I'm required to bring that. Staff, we appreciate your honesty. Yeah. yeah, staff has indicated there's actually a site plan comment for it to it show yeah. to 25 feet. So mm -hmm. the new fence will be at 25 feet. Okay, so if we, I just want to be clear, if we are to move with approval today, we are approving the faux wood, not white, and we are approving at 25 feet, not at 24 and change. Is that correct? Correct, but um, Composite. Composite. there should be, uh, I would recommend the board do an approval as amended and some proposed language would be utilizing Trex composite wood in Woodland Brown in lieu of the proposed PVC. Thank you. Is there a motion on the floor? Yep. Did you get a second, John? Well, there's I, about no, to no, be. No, 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 I'm going to make it right now, sorry. Wait for it. I would like to approve the certificate, motion to approve the certificate of appropriateness 2023-158 for the property located at 321 North Swinton Avenue, Old School Square Historic District by finding that the request and approval thereof is consistent with the comprehensive plan and meets criteria set forth in the land development regulations subject to the following conditions that the project utilizes Trex composite wood in Woodland Brown in lieu of the white PVC noted in the staff report and that the distance between the road and the Masonry wall is 25 feet. Second. And uh, Diane, before you call the roll, just very quickly, um, applicant, you've understood the amendment as proposed by the board? Yes, sir. Do you have any objection to that amendment? No, sir. Great, thank you. Thank you. We could call the roll. Ivan Heredia? Yes. Kristen Finn? Yes. Rhonda Saxton? Yes. John Miller? Yes. Jim Chard? Yes. Chris Cabezas? Yes. Elise Lindstrom? Yes. All right, moving right along. If we could please have staff read 9B into the record, Certificate of Appropriateness 2023-093 and 094. Uh, once again, for the record, I'm Michelle Hewitt. This, I would like to read into the record, agenda item 9B for 1180 to 1190 Nassau Street, Certificate of Appropriateness 2023-093 and 094. And Jim, if you would start us off with any ex parte, please. None, except I sh shook uh, Gary's hand when I came in. He actually hugged me. <laughs> Thank you for this. None. 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 Madam Chair, board members, uh, for the record, my address is uh, 1045 East Atlantic Avenue. My name is Gary Iliopoulos. I represent GE Architecture. Uh, also here tonight with me are my clients. Uh, we have Mark Harrison and we have uh, Mr. Graham. Ed Graham, um, should you have any questions for them, they were sworn in. They'd be happy to answer them. Um, you know, it was an interesting night. Um, you know, you, you were talking about districts. You're talking about... Uh, the historic, the history of Delray Beach. Uh, this particular project is in the Nassau district. Uh, it happens to be one of the districts where you can say almost every single house is historic, with the exception of my clients. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a little bit to this. I just got a Michelle or Katarina, what am I doing for just enter or is that working? Okay. So just a quick uh, location right here. So we're located on uh, the southwest side of Ocean Avenue in Nassau. Um, what's interesting about this project, there is a little bit of a silver lining to it. And the fact is, is that, so everybody knows that Sam Ogren was hired and commissioned to do 18 homes on Nassau. One was particularly on this one, it was built in 1935. 1988, it got torn down and was gonna be replaced with these townhouses. Um, the silver lining is, after that happened, they turned this into a historic district. So we did lose one, but we gained a district. The other beauty of this project is the following. My clients did not knock down that 1935 house, and they did not build these townhouses. But they are here to try and improve them, okay? So I think that's 
uh, important where I stand. I look at it. The other thing that's interesting about this project is that it's kind of isolated. Now, you'd say it's part of the district, but one of the things is that right to the west is another set of townhouses that blocks them from the actual historic homes, which are all along here. Uh, to the south, we have multifamily, again, blocking this. One of the things you're going to see in our presentation is the vegetation. Yeah, this, this is a, actually a unique building that you don't really see. Uh, this beauty right here to the north was actually done by one of our famous local architects who happens to be in the audience, Roger Cope. I believe that was in the 90s. Um, but I mean, the, the point that I do want to make is that this one is not actually seen the way you would think from the public right of way. So a lot of times when you're looking at things like this, you have to take that into consideration. Um, so we are showing the site plan. Basically, uh, what happened was in the 90s, uh, when this was approved, it had a lot of variances. It is in your package. It was very unique with the type of variances they were getting. Uh, they were either on the ground floor, then it was the second floor, then it was the third floor. Uh, thank goodness for staff. They helped me uh, go through this because it was one where it was extremely confusing. Um, the other part is the surrounding area. So I, I, I'm going to go to some blow-ups, but this one is a multifamily to the south. Uh, the, uh, what you would call a beigey looking building is directly to the west. Then you do have some historic houses that are kind of flanking it as you go west. And then of course I just mentioned the one that Roger worked on, which is on the north side of our property in Nassau Street. But there's the multifamily on the south side. Um, again, blocking any kind of visibility from the building that we'll be talking about tonight. Uh, this is actually the separation. This is the one that is along the north side of Nassau Street, which is 2226 South Ocean. Now, this is, this is the building that staff does talk about this, and they are right. You have to look at this and say, okay, this is the townhouse that's behind, okay? And they are similar, but yet I'll tell you they're not. Uh, they actually are quite different in the detailing, and everything is in the detailing. And one of the things I want to point out with regards to what we're proposing tonight is all about proportion, massing, and detailing. Um, the key about that is the following, is we can't change the massing of this building, it's existing. So we're trying to work with what we have. But when you look at this building, one of the unique things is that they have this little element right here. Now, when we go to my client's building, you're gonna see that's their main entrance. They have columns and everything's important. So it's not just hanging out here. The other thing that they're trying to do is really just get some more open porch space. That's what this whole project's really about, and maybe give a little better look of a building. Uh, up here, you'll see they have a wraparound porch. Uh, we don't have that. When you look at the building that we're dealing with, they're all windows up here. They don't have a big porch like that. Again, look at the massing. We got columns here that actually are designed to do a five-story parking structure. Um, and then they have what I guess you can call a Juliet roundabout where maybe you could walk around it, but you're not going to stay out there, okay? Um, the other part that's unique about this is just the banding, the roof tiles, again, the railings. There are so many things that aren't even close to what our building looks like and what it's going to look like. The other part's kind of unique is the landscaping. I mean, this is right on NASA. I mean, you basically see this. There's nothing here, even on the backside, which is surprising. Uh, but I think you're going to see that ours is quite different. Um, you're going to see that currently right now the windows are different. Uh, there's different patterns on it. Uh, the colors are different. The roof tile, everything. Now, what I'm getting at is I feel that we're okay by separating even further from them. Uh, I'm hoping, uh, and not that they would have to hire us, that they're going to actually catch on and want to make the changes that we're proposing tonight. Uh, this is the backside of my clients right now. This is 1180 and 1190. So you can see it is a little different from what I just showed you across the way. As you go to this elevation right here, now here's what you're seeing is basically what do you see from the streets? This is actually on Nassau. Uh, one of the things is, again, we don't have a wraparound porch. We have three windows up here. This little element right here is actually a Juliet balcony you don't have access to, but there are columns below supporting it. So it is different from the previous uh, building to the rear. Uh, again, this is actually 1190. Uh, it, it's only the multifamily to the south that would have a any kind of sense of seeing this. So again, you're really not seeing this building from the public right away the way you would think. Uh, again, this is actually right off of NASA. Here's the gate. Very hard to even see what's going on here. I realize we can't base everything on landscaping because landscaping can come down in a hurricane and that's why we are proposing to change the building. 
But again, when you look at this overall, which is a good shot, you do see this portion right here. And actually in this shot, it does look large, but we do have heavy vegetation all around it. And again, we have multifamily that's literally blocking it all the way around here. Um, right now, this is the proposed site plan. One of the things I want to point out is that we are not proposing any kind of additional lot coverage. We're literally just trying to revamp the exterior of this building and expand some of our covered porches. Uh, in staff's report, and I will repeat it here tonight, we do meet all the setback requirements. Uh, one of the things that's unique about setbacks is the fact that porches and roof overhangs can extend three feet into them. We are there, we do not exceed that. So again, I'm gonna be highlighting the setbacks. I'll try to go through this kind of quick for you, but not too fast that you're not seeing what we're trying to do. I just wanna simplify it for you. Uh, that's kind of indicating how our wraparound porches will be. Uh, on the uh, west side, I highlighted two blue areas. There are two porches that are on that side that basically have no access to them. Uh, we're basically proposing to enclose them and extend the ground floor laundry room out to those areas. It is covered, so again, we're not increasing the lot coverage, it's already existing. Uh, this would be our ground floor, this is the existing. And so what I did was I highlighted those two little porches along the west side. Now, with regards to the proposed ground floor, one of the things that we were doing is, is the following, is that you've got these porches that we've expanded for laundry room. And then you've, let me go back, sorry about that. And so basically, we see the dashed lines, we're basically showing where you have those rounded Juliet balconies, and then we're basically gonna be squaring them off above. Um, for some of the people that might remember this building, I'm going back to early 2000, probably around 2004, 2005, during the hurricane seasons, this is a wood frame structure. It was poorly built, you're on the ocean, it wasn't maintained, it was falling apart. The balconies were literally caving off. They had to come back to this board in around 2006 and seven because it was in such disrepair. Um, that's one of the problems when you're on the ocean and the other part is when you've got a building that's not totally structurally sound, uh, it's unique when you find two investors here that actually want to improve their properties and make sure they can stay here for the longevity of Delray and enjoy it like the rest of us. Um, we're at the second floor. Basically, you're seeing uh, how this layout is. You're seeing the balconies that they've got on the ocean side. Again, it's just wanting to try and improve this. We are on the third floor. We have a little roof over here that comes over here because they just want to get a little more covered area. I think one of the things is, is that, again, if this was the beginning of the project and I was designing for them, I would have large covered porches. Uh, you're on the ocean. I think you got to enjoy Florida. You got to have that indoor outdoor. Unfortunately, they bought it and they inherited this and you don't have those type of things and they're just trying to increase it a little bit. This being the proposed second floor. So you're seeing how the wraparound porches will work. Again, complying with all the setbacks. Third floor, really the big thing that will be happening in is that we're actually just showing the roof that will be built down below. And that's where you're seeing it right here, the wraparound roofs down below to give them some extra protection. Um, I think obviously the big thing you're gonna see now is clearly how we wanna change the elevations. But one of the things that we're doing is Again, proportions. Uh, you got a three-story building. We're trying to bring down the scale of this building. What we are introducing is what you call a pitch break. Pitch break is the farm. We're going to go around the perimeter. We're going to cut off the plywood on the roof, and we're going to add another truss in there at a different angle. So when the roof comes down, I have a little kick out like this. Again, it's adding a little character to this building that we think it warrants. Um, Basically what we have here are the proposed elevations. The top is the north existing, so that is 1180, and the bottom is um, the proposed. What I'm trying to do is, and one of the things that staff did talk about was uh, materials and railings. One of them was horizontal railings. Uh, they have made reference to that is more modern contemporary. I can't disagree with them, and the fact is you do see a lot of modern buildings today with horizontal railings. The fact is, that I would love to tell you I invented them. I didn't. They've been around for over 100 years. What we're trying to do is actually take this building, and we're trying to add some board and bat, which gives you the vertical. That's at that second floor. 
and then I'm trying to break it with some horizontal lines. And what this is doing is trying to create a composition of what we call a well-balanced building. When you look at the top part, it's all chopped up. They've got everything kind of, every kind of arch you can ever imagine. They've got every kind of window. They've got square windows, arch, it doesn't matter. Uh, right down here, you are seeing this area where we are enclosing it, and we're going to have a circular window for our laundry room. And those are the two areas that we're posing to change. Uh, we're changing all the columns. The columns will be narrower now. They're going to be more streamlined and actually relevant to what we're proposing, which is all clean, straight, square lines. So that would be the proposed north elevation. Um, we, think, we think that this is going to be a positive addition to the area. We think it actually does complement and is very similar to what Roger did to the north. And I'm not saying that because he's here. That was already in my presentation, but it is true. It's balancing the entrance uh, to this neighborhood, which is so important to our area. Um, this is our east elevation. So the north, I mean, the top part is your existing. You're seeing that we do have arched windows here. You're seeing these railings. Now, the previous photo of the building behind, they have straight white pickets. These are actually more in the Mediterranean style. Uh, again, they've got every single kind of shape and arch possible. Uh, our goal is to try and clean up everything so that it has a nice clean look and reflects what I think this neighborhood is all about. Uh, this is the south elevation, so this is actually 1190. This is the one that I really don't think anybody's going to be able to see, even if you wanted to. But the fact is, it's matching the north elevation for most part. Uh, again, we've got the board and bat. I, I will emphasize, too, we are doing what they call hardy plank. Um, I normally don't push hardy plank on buildings down here unless they are wood frame. They're meant to move with the building. The wood frame moves, and so that's why I think this is appropriate material for this building. Um, one of the things that staff did bring up, they are talking about some of the other materials. So we have some decorative brackets. The decorative brackets are what you call foam, but actually we have a urethane coating that we're doing on it. Basically, the best example I can give you is a surfboard. Surfboards are meant to be in the water. That's what these brackets are. They are designed for this weather. One of the problems that we have is when we're trying to design for historic structures, which again, this is not historic. It's not even contributing. Probably never be contributing in my lifetime. Okay? But the fact is, I want it to last. So the materials that we're picking on this are what we think are good in style and design for the neighborhood and will last for my clients. Uh, last elevations, if you would, would be the proposed west elevation. Uh, we are proposing to change the garage doors, as you can see on the bottom, uh, squaring off some of the windows, and again, introducing the board and bat, and of course, the different roof lines with the pitch brakes. Uh, that concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer anything that you may have. Uh, it was a pleasure being here. Thank you, guys. I hope I get your support tonight. Gary, one quick question. What's the roof material? That right there is a roof, it's concrete, charcoal gray tile. It's basically got a tapered look to it, almost looks like a, a slate, if you will. Is it S-tile on there now? or is It's it... S-tile now, okay. yes. For the record, I'm Katharina Palavota, Historic Preservation Planner. Okay. okay, so this is a certificate of appropriateness, um, and it is for um, the property um, located at 1180 and 1190 Nassau Street. So I know Mr. Eliopoulos did read a little bit of the history um, because there's the significance of the lot and the history of the Nassau Park Historic District. I'm gonna go over just a little bit more um, of the history in detail. Um, so the subject properties consist of lots one and two, uh, Nassau, uh, Nassau Point subdivision zoned RM, which is multifamily residential. Uh, and it's located within the Nassau Park Historic District. The structure is not contributing and the Nassau Point subdivision consists of lots one through four and contains two buildings, each containing two three-story residential units. The two buildings are adjoined by a common interior courtyard, paper driveway with access from Nassau Street. 
The Nassau Park Historic District was originally conceived in 1935 as the first planned residential development south of Atlantic Avenue. Originally platted as Ashbury Park Heights, it was renamed Nassau Park in 1935 by developer R.C. McNeil, who commissioned Sam Ogren Sr. to design the first house located at 234 South Ocean Boulevard in 1935. And that was a subject property um, that we're looking at here. So the original 1935 home on the subject property was demolished um, in 1988 to make room for um, what's currently on site today, which is the multifamily residential um, property. And this action uh, could have signaled the end of the Nassau Park, the end of Nassau Park as a single family residential neighborhood. by bringing about a domino effect of the new development and construction. Instead, that single demolition became the catalyst for the designation of the Nassau Park Historic District. Nassau Park's close proximity to the beach and charming yet simple stylish architecture of its small scale houses made the neighborhood highly desirable and successful from its inception. 18 houses were built between 1935 and 1941 with four more houses built in the 1950s and 1960s. The homes were inspired by colonial Cape Cod revival style. The area is flourishing and most of the small quaint cottages have undergone substantial rehabilitation by caring owners who appreciate the value of their properties. The pride of ownership has contributed to the steady increase in property values and continued, to, continued desire to preserve small residential communities, one of the few remaining historic enclaves representative of the early days of life in Delray Beach. Okay, so the request before the board tonight, um, this includes um, architectural style change as, long, as well as exterior modifications um, to the easternmost three-story, two-unit residential structure. So the two areas highlighted here, um, they're individually owned. Um, both of these are the, um, a part of the subject request tonight. Um, specifically, the request includes a change from the existing Mediterranean Revival style to masonry vernacular, new slate tile roof, new decorative architectural features, the enclosure of the existing 97 square foot covered porch, um, which is on the west side of each of the structures, and the addition of a two-story wraparound porch on the north, northeast and, north, and southeast sides of the structure. So here is the existing survey of the site. So here we can see the property lines as well as the individual um, townhouses. This is the proposed site plan. So as you can tell, um, Mr. Eliopoulos did mention that the square footage of the structures were not changing. However, there were some slight modifications, um, not just to the exterior style, but as well as on the enclosure of the ground, um, the ground porches, as well as um, the connection of the two balconies on the second floor um, to make a wraparound porch. So here we see the existing first floor plan, as well as the proposed. Um, you can see that the only significant modification would be the enclosure of the porches on the bottom. Mm. And then here we see the existing second floor plan along with the proposed and to the northeast and southeast sides of the property. Um, you can see on the existing floor plan, there are existing balconies, um, which will now be joined um, on, the, on the proposal to make the wraparound porches for the second floor. Here's existing third floor plan, um, minus the, the change in the, um, the structure of the roof, uh, there are no real significant um, changes like, the, like about the balconies on the first and second floor. Okay, so here we have the existing um, front elevation um, as seen today. This is 1180, so you can mostly see the, um, just this structure or this townhouse from the north side elevation. Here from the northwest, you can see both sides, 1180 and 1190. Let me go back a little bit. So here, um, where we see the, um, the open air porches right here, these are what's proposed to be enclosed. Okay, this is the northeast elevation. Uh, from this side, you can also see um, both structures. And then um, here, a little bit more clearly, you can see the existing balconies. Um, on the on the second floor that will be um, joined and made a wraparound porch. This is the southeast elevation, so you can see the porches 
1190 as well. Okay, and this is the east elevation um, that shows both sides. Okay, so this is the uh, existing west elevation. So here we can see um, on the side here, I've included the proposed changes. So the architectural styles will completely change um, from the Mediterranean Revival uh, to the masonry vernacular, um, as well as any um, arch designs that is typical for Mediterranean Revival will be removed um, to, um, to match the, the new masonry um, vernacular style. Siding will change. Um, as I previously mentioned, the existing porches, I have them highlighted below here. Um, and then, um, as well as uh, Mr. Eliopis did mention, there are new materials that are proposed to the exterior. Um, in addition, um, they did propose low E glass. Um, here is the existing east elevation. So um, essentially the same, the same things as the, the, um, the previous elevation, the different changes of architectural style. Uh, but here you can see a little bit more clearly the difference between um, the balconies. So here, there's a change in the arch of the windows, and then um, here you can see the new, um, the new horizontal style of the balconies as well as um, how they connect. And then this one, I think you can see it better too. On the north elevation, um, these are the existing balconies, and here's where they're connected, as well as you can see the changes to the enclosed porch on the ground floor. Okay, and this is the south elevation, so this is mostly showing 1190. And um, same as the north side, here you can see um, the enclosure of the ground floor porch and then the connecting of the balconies. So these are the proposed materials and colors. So the colors are also changing um, as well as the material for the roof. Here's some renderings. I'm just gonna go through these briefly. So this is the east rendering for the north, south, okay, and then this is, oh. so this is another image just once again just showing all of the different changes, mm -hmm. um, but mostly on the west side so you can see um, both of the townhouses. As Mr. Eliopoulos did mention, um, staff did have con some, some concerns. Um, it, we know in the staff report, and I'll note again, this is a non-contributing um, structure. Um, it was built in 1998, so um, in maybe in the next you know, 10 years with the resurvey, this isn't going to be um, recommended as a historic structure. However, because we are analyzing this as you know, a structure within the historic district as well as looking at the Secretary of the Interior standards and the visual compatibility standards, um, we always hope that you know structures within the 50 years of them being constructed that they will eventually become historic. So, um, as you know, preservation, preservationists, this is how we're analyzing what we're seeing today. Um, so, the change of architectural style, um, because this is not a contributing structure, um, he, uh, the change of style isn't. Um, I want to say as much as a concern. However. Um, Regarding the, um, the Secretary of Interior standards, you know, if this were a contributing structure, um, you know, this would completely um, diminish the historic integrity of the structure. So these are things as, you know, preservation as we do take in consideration. Um, visual compatibility for um, the porches. Um, Mr. Eliopoulos did mention um, the design. Um, we do see with a lot more modern styles that they do have um, the more horizontal style um, balconies. However, within our historic districts, especially Nassau, um, this particular style is not common. So uh, regarding visual compatibility, you know, with what's available on the streetscape, um, our concern is that the, the style um, doesn't match within the district. And with the hopes that this would eventually um, become historic, you know, we're looking at the materials and what's available in the district today. Um, Mr. Eliopoulos did mention the cellophone. This is also one of our concerns because, once again, this is not a material that is used within the historic districts. Um, it's not common, so um, visual compatibility wise, um, it's not really compatible for the district. In our in historic districts, we focus on more um, 
authentic materials. Um, so this isn't something that we are seeing on historic buildings. Um, another um, comment um, we noticed on the site plan, um, they did mention that the glass would have um, a gray tint to match what's existing. Um, at a previous um, HPB meeting, um, there was a discussion about the difference between low E and um, gray window tint and what would be appropriate to see in historic districts. Um, it was decided that um, gray would be more appropriate um, for contributing structures um, and that, or for non-contributing structures. And then for contributing, uh, because they don't have to meet the energy calculations, um, clear would be appropriate. Um, so I know that they are requesting, um, in one area they did request low E, um, but as they had the note that mentioned the glass would be gray tint to match, we found that to be um, an acceptable alternative because this is a non-contributing structure. Um, so we did add that as a site plan technical item, item that they um, item that they use the gray um, to match existing instead of the the proposed low E window tint. Um, I'm mentioning again the architectural style. Um, let's see, and I have two images. Um, the right hand side is I think that's 1160 and 1170. Um, that is the structure um, adjacent to them um, to the west. So our concern is, you know, because this is, um, the properties are unified, they're all together. Um, our concern is once, you know, this one changes the architectural style, you know, the, the unity of the, the design will no longer match. Um, that's not to say that, you know, once this is completed, as Mr. Iliopoulos did say that, you know, they could come in and, you know, completely redo it to match. But um, as they haven't come in right now, this is our concern visual compatibility-wise. Um, let's see. Okay, so this is our Secretary of the Interior standards. Um, as this is a non-contributing structure, um, a lot of these will not apply because these are for historic structures. Um, but once again, you know, we're looking kind of ahead, you know, to whether or not this could be recommended as a contributor within the 50 years that it's constructed. So um, we have analyzed that um, against the structures in the proposal. And here we have the highlighted um, visual compatibilities, uh, mostly ones that we, um, some are met and then some we have concerns with. I uh, mentioned architectural style, um, relationship to materials, um, roof shapes. Um, the roof shape is slightly changing um, but because this is non-contributing, there are no real concerns because there's no real historic integrity that's being altered. These are your regular findings. So based off of these as well, 246H5 um, as well as 451, you have to decide whether or not um, the request um, before you is appropriate, um, not only for um, the historic district, um, but based off of the Secretary of the Interiors and the visual compatibility standards. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Do we have any public comment? Any rebuttal from the applicant? Uh, I, I'm not necessarily rebuttal, just clarification. Um, one is with regards to the gray tint, we are definitely going with gray tint. The existing structure does have gray tint. Uh, it was actually on our window schedule, they called out the low E. Um, one of the things with regards to railings, I think staff brings up a good point, but the fact is you got to look at the whole district. There are no balconies in our district. So you do have the project that Roger did to the north, which does have X railings, but otherwise there are none. Um, so it's kind of to say that something doesn't exist. Well, yeah, because there are none. So that's the reason that I would say I think we should have the right to do the horizontal. Um, I did make a mistake, probably several in my presentation, but I said my clients were investing in their property. I don't want it to make it sound like they are investors. They are definitely living there. This is their homes, this is where they live. Um, I think the other part would be with regards to the townhouses behind, I understand this is fee simple. I'm not a lawyer, but they are separately owned properties. They actually have separate properties down the main driveway. They just share that driveway with an easement. So I think that's important to understand they are separate. Thank you very much. Rebuttal from staff. Staff has a rebuttal. Board discussion. I had a question for staff. Were these built in 1988 or 1998? I believe it was 1988. Let me okay. double check. 
And along those lines, does it reset the clock? In other words, the 50 year, the, all these additions, I mean, is the structure, what, how does that, do we know? It, it does not. So once it's constructed, um, they can have alterations. And just like, you know, the actual physical, like uh, square footage of the building, anything that's addition to it within the 50 years that that comes in, that can also be considered as contributing. Have the neighbors been contacted, the ones that own the other? This is directed, I guess, towards the clients. Well, we submitted. No, do I do that so, yet? You have to ask who. You Wait, did you? Oh, was it? It's 1988. 88. Okay. Thank you. This is directed, I guess, towards the owners. Yes. The the. Um, Mark, you have to come and state your name for the record and address. Mark Harrison, 1190. I was sworn in before. Um, Mr. Green, who is at 1170, has recently sold his property, and the new buyer um, actually is interested in doing this herself. She supports it, and everybody who lives there, all four, signed a letter saying they don't object, which I think you submitted that, yeah. correct? So everybody who lives within there is supporting this. I have a little technical thing that um, I... I don't think your, your color choice, the name of your color choice, if you look that up, it looks more like a shake color, like a, a wood tone, brown. And yet your photograph of it is a dark charcoal. But for the roof. When, when, for the roof. When you go to their website, it's a, a brown tone. Thank you. It will be charcoal gray. That's. I just didn't want us to get locked into that exact number and all and have it approved. So if it just says charcoal gray, that's, that's great. Um, it's always surprising to me when, uh, is it, are we in board discussion? Yes. Yeah. It's always surprising to me how creative an architect can be in um, transforming the whole feel of a, a shell of a house and, and make it feel totally different um, in, um, this is an opinion. <laughs> uh, I have always felt that that building was a sore thumb on that corner, just the style of it and everything. If, even if it's a three story, if it had been done, uh, more sensitively to the style of the beach area and yet it wasn't, um, I don't see anything that, I even like the rails. Um, and as uh, Gary mentioned, there are no rails like along this line for single family homes, but it, it blends in with the um, beach area. This house has never blended in. It's never been part, a cohesive part of Nassau Park. And um, so I guess I am in support of the project and my only concern is the, um, the use of your materials for the, um, they kind of look like outriggers, but they're not. Kind cell of foam. The cell foam. Uh, that would be my concern and my objection. But everything else looks uh, very nice. I agree with Rhonda. Um, I remember when the hurricanes caused a breach in, I want to say it was the right side of this. Um, and it sat there for years and the whole inside was fogged up and molded up. And mm -hmm. I was surprised that actually they didn't just tear the whole thing down. Um, but I agree that that Meisner-ish, you know, a Mediterranean revival style when it went up there just didn't fit. Um, this is still big. It's the same footprint. I think the vernacular style fits in much better. Um, I would, I would like to see if they could consider something other than the foam because the woodpeckers get in there and they make nests. And if that's what I'm thinking of, um, yeah, this is a different product. I know okay. what you're talking about. You All are right. talking about a foam where they actually do a, a stucco coating over it. Correct. Um, you can't protect those. I, I'll just, yeah. just for the record, you you know, if you that. look at uh, Opal Grand, we literally have eight foot high brackets made out of this. 
We brought them on site to try and hit them with a hammer. You can't break these. There's no peckers that are getting in there. <laughs> right. Probably the wrong term, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, I've, I've, I've cocked up plenty of holes in my house. Um, but no, I, I agree with Rhonda. I, I'm not opposed with the change of style. I think it fits in more with the neighborhood. Um, it's not contributing in any way, shape, or form. I wouldn't be opposed if they eliminated it from the district, honestly. Um, and that would create a higher density of contributing structures. And as far as it being different from the other one, the other two units, I mean, Sam Ogren didn't design one house and replicate it 18 times down that street. He did all individual different houses. So. Um, if there's a difference between this one and that one, and if they come back with a request down the road, hopefully it's a little bit different than this one, and it's not exactly the same as well. So I'm okay with it. I agree as well. I think it's a great improvement to what's there. It's tasteful. Um, I like, you know, there's only so much you can do with something like this and keeping it the same, the same size. So I, I, I like what was done. Um, the, the exterior wall for the, for the community, I guess, that's gonna stay the same color as this is. This is we were the, actually painting it. Yeah, we were gonna paint that whole, along the that side, yeah, and along the front. Yeah, we did say we would okay. paint it. That's better. Um, so I'm in support of this. Uh, really, no, no additional comments other than uh, maybe the board and batten is a little heavy. Uh, you know, I like to see an, a nice base, a middle, and a top. I, I know the roof is the top, but um, you know, I think proportion, proportionally, the the openings uh, are going to work much better. Um, yeah, I like. I, you know, I think this is in keeping with uh, the vernacular of the district. Gary, I have a technical comment. Is that the way you spell rendering? <laughs> <laughs> Thank God that's not my slide. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the railings are the ones that, you, you say there are no other railings in the historic district? Well, I'm saying in this district, you do have the building to the north that Roger did. They have an X yeah, pattern right. with actually plexiglass, that. and then that's it. That's it. Yeah. And what are, what are the railings made of? Ours are aluminum. And they will be black? Uh, they're a dark charcoal. Dark charcoal, OK. And uh, you said the tinted glass. Do you have a rough idea of how much tinting? I just know we're going to match whatever. We're going to actually go and look at the windows and do the reading on what the tent they had, because we're going to match the same tent that the, because we're not replacing all the windows. OK. Yeah, because we've gone through that a lot of times on how how much of a tent is a tent and is there any glass that doesn't have a tent and all of those sorts of well, questions. they have percentages. So yeah. you're right. And they will say whether they have a 20, a 60 and 80. Right. So we're going to match whatever they do have. So this way we're consistent. So if it's 80, you would match 80, whatever it is to be consistent. I don't think you're going to want to see a different one. It helps you replacing all the windows. Well, my owner just said they're going to replace all the windows. So I think we're okay. We'll get, we'll get a nice tent on it that will not be too bright. We have to still honor, obviously, sea turtles and stuff like that. So when we do this, we do our lighting specs, but we'll actually conform to the state regulations on the tent. But the tent will be a lower tent? Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Are we ready right. to make a motion? Mm -hmm. Okay, I move to approve. The Certificate of Appropriateness Request for 2023-093 and 094 for the property located at 1180 Nassau Street, Nassau Park Historic District by finding that the request and approval thereof is consistent with the comprehensive plan and meets the criteria set forth in the land development regulations. Second. Did you call the roll, please? Ivan Heredia. Yes. Kristen Finn? Yes. Rhonda Saxton? Yes. John Miller? Yes. Jim Chard? Yes. Chris Cabeza? Yes. Elise Lindstrom? Yes. 
Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted, for the record, it is for both buildings. I mean, both units, 1180 and 1190, because the motion just said one. <laughs> it was, there was just one in that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hold, please hold, Gary. I'll see if we can do a second <laughs> motion. And one of my so clients the, was happy. Right, so the, <laughs> the motion that was in the staff report references both files 093 and 094. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, if the board just confirms that the motion was the, the motion presented by staff is what you read? Yes. Yeah. So that, that motion should apply to both files, 2023-093 and 2023-094. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time, everybody. Thank you. All right. We are on 9C, Certificate of Appropriateness 2022-294. Staff, if you would read it into the record, please. <laughs> what? Roger, did you bring a copy for the record? Uh, I'll leave, be more than happy to leave that behind. Um, uh, for the for the record, uh, everybody, first of all, good evening. Uh, Madam sorry, Chair and Roger. Board. Oh, yeah. I'm so sorry. I need the staff to read it into the record before sorry, we Roger. begin. Please. Oh, okay. <laughs> sorry. Um, this is Certificate of Appropriateness um, Demolition and Variance Request. I'm entering CO, file COA 2022-294 into the record. This is for 22, um, <laughs> 226 North Swinton Avenue. And Jim, if you could start us with ex parte, please. None. 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 All right, Roger, the floor is yours. Okay, for, uh, for the record, Roger, Cope, Cope Architects, Inc., uh, 701 Southeast First Street in the uh, National Marina Historic District. Madam Chair and Board, thank you for hearing our item tonight. Thank you for being patient. It's been a long night, and item number one was phenomenal. Uh, I want to thank Michelle Hoyland and her very trusty staff, two of which are sitting right in front of you, uh, Katharina Palawoda and Michelle Hewitt. Uh, they've been phenomenal in guiding us through this process. Uh, our property uh, is a spectacular award-winning property, as you can see uh, uh, from the, uh, the commendation that's sitting there in front of you. Um, I'm joined tonight uh, with Mr. Mr. Matthew Scott, uh, he's our legal counsel with uh, Danae Mis Miskell, Bonnie Miskell, and, and uh, Backman out of Boca Raton. And last but not least, Mr. Jan, uh, John Babiars is the owner of the property, and he's sitting here. All three of us are more than willing to uh, entertain any questions at the end of the evening if you have a question for, for any of us about anything that you see tonight. This is really the last of, of a, of a multi-phase improvement to 226 uh, uh, North Swinton Avenue. And it's uh, very, very simply put, it's the garage component uh, that's in the back of the property. And uh, because we've, uh, we've, done, we've done everything from paint the building to remove screened in enclosures, to remove uh, some canvas awnings. And uh, uh, we've done new landscaping. We've done a brand new pool in the back. We've, we've done some civil engineering stuff that's phenomenal. And we're down to the garage in the back uh, because we have inherited a, uh, the garage on the property is structurally unsound. So um, I'm not sure how to make this dude go forward. There we go. So, uh, so this is just a visual uh, image of the, of the property uh, as seen from Swinton Avenue. Uh, the original historic little cottage to the right, then uh, our 2007 addition to the left. Um, the, uh, let's see. This, this is an overall sort of drone image of the property. And, and, and really, the brass tacks of it is the little tiny garage that's up in the upper right-hand corner with the barrel tile roof that you can see peeking over the, uh, the back edge of the house uh, and the tree lines. Uh, there it is maybe in, a, in a, a, a better vantage point from further away. Uh, and so, so really, you guys, all, it is, all this is is about a garage. And, and, and 
Back in the day, this little garage uh, uh, was a, a single car garage. Uh, it, uh, it, you can barely stand up on the inside of it because cars were very, very small back then. We're not even sure that it was designed for an automobile. It could have very easily been designed and, uh, and, 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 and built to the scale to accommodate a horse and, and a carriage. We don't know that. Uh, but, uh, it, it, and it's deficient, structurally speaking. Uh, the, we've submitted all kinds of photographs, uh, engineering reports to staff to satisfy their requirements on, on, on the justification for its demolition. And uh, we're proposing to come back with a, uh, a structure that is modern uh, in terms of its, its, its construction and, and essentially is, is in as near uh, uh, an exact position on the site as this existing guy is. But we're coming back with a two car garage, not a single car garage. And we're actually making it usable so you can actually park a garage in it, or park a car in it. Um, so uh, n just another uh, shot from, from far away. We'll get right to the site plan. This is a site plan uh, that represents existing conditions. And the little tiny garage is in the upper left-hand corner. We've got a beautiful, very improved alley behind us. And so uh, uh, we are taking full advantage of that alley. Uh, 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 the existing garage was never accessible from the alley. Our garage is fully accessible from the alley. Uh, and and uh, conversely, here is the proposed site plan with the uh, new proposed garage in that upper left hand corner. Uh, now some technicalities here. The, uh, the existing garage is non-conforming. That's why we had to file for a variance. Uh, be we are making it less non-conforming, but we're not making it fully conforming. So uh, we are pulling it off the north property line uh, by 100% of what exists today. It, it used to sit on the property line. And so uh, we're pulling it off the property line uh, uh, two feet. And there's uh, our prior owner of the property, who I was commissioned by back in 2007, actually bought one foot of the neighbor's property to our north when he first bought the property. And uh, uh, because uh, he thought that there needed to be a, a one foot strip uh, that he could maintain and own and, and then, uh, you know, and, and uh, ha accommodate, have accommodated uh, the, uh, the little garage that's sitting there. So, so there's been all kinds of uh, history with respect to this little garage and, and where it's positioned on the site. It's non-conforming to that north property line, but it's also non-conforming to the rear property line, which is along the alley. And we're, we're correcting the rear setback, but not necessarily the north. And staff has, has, has given us full approval in terms of the position uh, that we're proposing. So, uh, so a series of exterior elevations would show you uh, how the little tiny garage uh, is, is uh, harmonious within the overall context of the house itself. And so this is a, uh, uh, a the current the image on the top is of the current conditions with the existing little garage poking its head up in the, in the far right hand side. And below is the, uh, the home with the newly designed garage uh, in that same position. And you can see there's just virtually no difference uh, to speak of. Um, we're, we're putting the same barrel tile roof on it that it, that it has today. Uh, the exterior skin of it, we are changing. Uh, it's the only structure on the site, the only exterior wall of anything on the site that has a, 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 a wooden shiplap siding on it. And uh, although we were originally proposing to come back with a garage with shiplap siding, uh, staff asked us if we uh, would consider making it stucco so that it's more hum harmonious with the main house. And we said, of course we would. So that's why we uh, have made it stucco rather than uh, shiplap siding. It'll last 150 years longer than, it, than if it were wood. So we were happy to make that adjustment. 
the next elevation is of the back of the property, if you will. Uh, this is, uh, the garage is not in this image uh, because our application is also seeking to infill uh, a little tiny rear screened in porch on the main house itself, which is directly opposite our little garage. And so that's why you see this image. And so the upper image is the existing condition, the screened in porch on the far left. The lower image is of that screened in uh, porch basically infilled. And so uh, very little to no architecture to speak of there. Um, this image, uh, again, the top, that's the existing garage on the right with its horizontal clapboard siding. It's got a single little window on this uh, north elevation. And the lower image is the brand new garage. We've eliminated the window altogether because it's essentially looking over into the uh, north neighbor's property. There's no need for us to have any kind of visual connection there. Uh, so uh, it's about the same length. You can see that it's shoved to the left further so that it's abiding by the rear setback line. And so it's pushing itself a little bit closer to the main house, but we're, we're doing that in good faith, trying to uh, uh, do the right thing and make it more uh, conforming. And then uh, this image is of the garage itself. This, this is the, these are all four elevations of the uh, proposed garage. Uh, the left side is the alley elevation uh, with the 16 foot wide two car garage door. Uh, which we're adorning with the decorative uh, real wood applied elements to make it mimic the original door that was on the original garage. Uh, and then the image to the right of that, staying on the top of the page, that's the east elevation, which we started out with. That's a little guy that's poking itself, po poking its image around the front edge of the house on the very first image I showed. And then the two Two bottom images are, again, of the, the, the one on the left is that facing the neighbor to the north with no door, no window, no nothing there. And then finally, last but not least, the, the image in the bottom right is uh, as seen from within our rear yard, not seen by uh, any uh, public right away. It's got one window in the front edge of it. Um, this is simply nothing more than a comparison in floor plans. Uh, the image in the dead center is the existing garage. The image to the left of that is the proposed uh, new two-car garage. Uh, and the image to the far right is, I don't know what that is. That's the, was the roof plan to the original garage. It's just a smidge bigger in the two-car version. Uh, but again, uh, in today's modern day requirements of a family that lives in a beautiful house along North Swinton Avenue, a one car garage doesn't quite cut it. Two car does. We're not coming to you and proposing a second level mother-in-law suite, which most people would have. Uh, we're just simply uh, trying to accommodate two automobiles for uh, convenience of modern day living. And uh, without much more dialogue, there's a copy of our survey, which we uh, are always happy to present. It's a, it's a very interesting site, uh, but you can see this is kind of representative of the existing garage. If you look kind of carefully, you can see how close to the, uh, it's within a foot of the north property line. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, we're increasing that to, from one foot to two feet. Um, finally, staff has given us a little bit of uh, critique with respect to our garage door itself, which faces the alley. And uh, uh, w there are two houses to the south of us down the same alley, uh, one of them two houses to the south of us, and one of them three houses to the south of us. Uh, they, are, they are both new construction, so they're infill, if you will, but they came before the Historic Preservation Board at some point in time years ago. And their rear garage doors are, in my opinion, quite awful. And this is exactly what we're not doing. Uh, these are, these are impact-resistant garage doors that are all aluminum. They barely have a coat of white paint on them. They might have some slight 
fake uh, wood grain in them somehow. Uh, but but this is uh, this is one of them. Excuse me. And this is the other one. Uh, this is uh, if this is what we were proposing, I would hope staff would criticize us. But but we're not proposing those types of doors. We're proposing uh, where to go. We're proposing a, a very ornate uh, upper left hand corner. Uh, we're proposing. Uh, we're applying wood paneling and detailing to our impact resistant garage door and making it look like a carriage house, uh, which was inspired by the original door on the front of the existing garage. So uh, you guys, thank you for your attention. It's been a long night. Uh, again, I wanna thank staff for everything, especially Michelle Hill, she, she's gone above and beyond in, in helping us out in, in this process. It's been you know, year and a half from our phase one to this phase. We're very excited to finish this thing off. We support, we, we hope you support the garage. Um, and we're here to answer any questions if you have anything. We're gonna paint the garage the exact same color as the main house, which staff already approved and pretty straightforward. Thank you very much. And we think we'll win another award uh, next year. <laughs>
And then here is the side or south elevation of the structure. And then another uh, angle of the side or south elevation. So here we have the existing survey. All of the existing structures are highlighted in blue. And the uh, hardscape is highlighted in the pinkish color. And there's a pool which also has hardscaping around it as well. Here we have the uh, existing site plan uh, where you can again see the existing structures highlighted in blue, the pool in the lighter blue, and the hardscaping um, highlighted in this pinkish color. So here we have the proposed site plan. All of the proposed elements um, are highlighted in red. So the request specifically includes the demolition of the existing one car garage and construction of a new two car garage, hardscape modifications, and a variance request to reduce the required seven foot six setback to two feet on the north property line. Exterior modifications to the main residence include removal of a brick screen wall in the front, which you can see highlighted there on the right, um, along with the window and door on the rear porch and the existing fence between the residence and garage. So here we have a little close up of the proposed variance. Um, a two foot uh, setback is uh, requested where I should say one foot two inches was previously existing. So you can see the outline of the existing garage versus the proposed in the red. Here we have the garage demolition plan and the proposed garage plan. And then these are the both of them uh, next to each other. So you can see um, existing and proposed. Okay, so here we have the existing north elevation. Uh, you can see at the top is the existing, everything is highlighted in blue. And then at the bottom is the proposed, new elements are highlighted in red. The, as the garage is being demolished, it is a new structure, so the whole item has been highlighted in red. And there are some modifications proposed to the rear porch. For materials, the um, garage does currently have existing, is using wood, currently is constructed of wood, so the use of that material would be considered most appropriate. However, they are proposing to match the existing stucco on the main residence. Uh, they are other, all other materials uh, and colors are proposed to match the existing structure. Here we have the existing west elevation. Again, at the top is the existing everything highlighted in blue and at the bottom is the proposed with the new elements highlighted in red. Uh, if you look at the bottom left corner, that's the side that faces the alley. Uh, there is concern regarding the two car expanse of the proposed garage door along the alley um, as the use of a single car or the appearance of a single car garage is most appropriate um, or one bay um, is most appropriate for structures within historic districts. Here we have the existing south elevation on the left, everything in blue is existing, and then the proposed on the right, uh, red, um, is proposed. So here we have the proposed east elevation. This is the front of the structure. This space is North Swinton Avenue. Again, at the top uh, is existing, everything highlighted in blue, and at the bottom is the proposed. So you can see the garage highlighted there in red, um, a single car um, entrance is still proposed. However, the size has changed slightly from what's existing. Um, and then there's a small rectangle there um, indicating where the existing brick wall is proposed or screen brick is proposed to be removed. So some excerpts from the staff report this is from the Secretary of Interior Standards. As previously mentioned, there is concern regarding the two-car expanse door proposed on the west side along the alley. The door is proposed to be constructed with white insulated aluminum, which is considered appropriate. Um, it's not designed as two, individu two individual openings. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so that's <laughs> for that one. Mm -hmm. And then for, so these are some excerpts from the visual compatibility standards. Um, there is concern with the use of a proposed synthetic man-made trim around the garage door, as synthetic materials are not considered appropriate nor authentic for use within historic structures. Um, and then there are new windows and doors proposed in the rear that are proposed to be white frame aluminum. However, they are requesting low E glass. It is important to note that this structure is contributing and exempt from meeting energy calculations. Um, so the use of low E has been discussed uh, with the board 
um, as not being appropriate for contributing structures. So uh, these are the findings for the variance that they've requested, which they've made responses to, um, and staff has as well. Here is an excerpt from there, uh, which states that the requested variance for the site interior setback is not anticipated to diminish the historic character um, of the site nor the district. Um, there is no concern regarding negative impacts of the historic integrity of the site and visual compatibility requirement, as it would generally match what is currently there. The existing one-car garage was likely originally constructed as a carriage house or a stable or storage shed. Since the existing garage is proposed to be demolished, this could create a false sense of history for the property as the new garage is proposed to be a larger, more modern two-car garage. But given its placement in the rear of the property tucked behind the historic home, it is within an area that can be considered appropriate. So here we have the demolition standards that the applicant and staff um, looked at and analyzed. So here have an excerpt from there. Um, an attorney letter for the property states that the garage is in an extreme state of disrepair and cannot be used by the applicants because of the unsafe condition it is in. An appraisal was also submitted that does not necessarily indicate the current condition of the garage, but notes that the demolition and construction of a new garage will increase the market value by $160,000, where the appraisal with the current garage lowers the market value by $20,000 than without it. Here we have uh, the 10 standards for the Secretary of Interior Standards for Rehabilitation with the highlighted um, or applied elements uh, that the staff used to analyze the request. Here we have the visual compatibility standards, again, the highlighted elements that were used to analyze the request. And here are the findings that uh, staff used for the analysis. And that concludes my presentation. All right, we have any public comment? George Long, 46 North Swinton. I've done a lot of successful dumpster diving when they were remodeling that house, and I don't want any of your garage. Just go ahead and throw it all away. But actually, uh, actually, the, actually, the guys over there were working. Actually, I go over morning, every morning. I go down and grab a board and come home, and they actually set them out beside the dumpster for me, and they invited <laughs> me in. So we're going to throw that out. You want any? So anyway, it's it's going to it's going to end up being a fence. A vernacular fence, but um, there's not even necessary for me to say this, but I will anyway. That house calls for a two-car garage. You just got to look at this big house there. My gosh, yeah, there's no doubt about it. And you guys can worry about the details and materials. And also, um, coming in from the alley uh, and parking two cars takes away some of the cars in the front. And one of the things in the historic district that they bring up a lot for contributing structures anyway. Park in the back as much as you can. So we've got a, several things covered there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do we have any rebuttal from the applicant? Yeah, just a couple of items that I, um, maybe the first one is um, the uh, use of, of man-made products on the house. We, we attempted to do that very early on, and, and I accidentally left a note or two on the drawings that might still allude to that, I assure you. And I've assured uh, Michelle that we're going to use real wood uh, detailing on the outside of this house, uh, outside of the garage. Uh, nothing will be man-made. So, and I, and I promise to clean up those couple of notes when we submit the certified set of documents. Uh, this is the, it's kind of interesting. It's the first time I've ever heard of a historic house not requiring low E glass, but we are not air conditioning this garage. So I really don't think we care what kind of glass we put in it. Uh, you know, we're, we'll save a couple of bucks and not put in low E glass. We'll put in clear glass. We have no intention of air conditioning in the garage. Um, uh, secondly, the, the, the discussion uh, of a single car garage versus two individual car garages separated by a column in the middle, it, it would widen the garage, in our opinion, by a couple of feet, and we're trying to keep the garage as narrow as possible. Uh, we res 
respectfully disagree with that opinion. We, we would rather keep a very narrow 16 foot wide two car garage door. We've designed the detailing of it to appear as if it's a couple of different doors. It's not one big gigantic carriage door. Uh, so we've gone out of our way a little bit uh, to, to make it appear as if it's two doors. Um, so I would just, uh, as you can see by the two samples that, uh, examples that we presented, the other two uh, garages uh, a couple hundred feet away, they're both uh, single car garage doors. Uh, and last but not least, uh, the, the, the brick wall, screen wall on the front of the property that we asked to be removed, we've changed our mind on that. We'd like to, that to remain. And I'll change the, the, the notation of that in the certification sets. And that's really a, a, it's a positive thing. It was added, we think, in 2007. It's not really original, but we've decided not to eliminate it. So it kind of make it simplifies the application a little bit. But uh, that's it. And appreciate, we appreciate the public support. Rebuttal or cross examination from staff? And from staff. Thank you. All right. Board discussion. I think <clears throat> I think it's a modest proposal. Um, I'm fine with it. There, it, I had a quick question. It looked like there was a pool in the back there. This doesn't impede on the pool. Is the pool being filled, or so it looks like it? So, John, the original pool was uh, was a, uh, a uh, organic kidney shaped kidney pool. Shape, yeah. And uh, we demoed it with, oh, okay. with permit, with permission, we demoed it and we built a, uh, a, a modern rectangular pool with modern amenities, modern features that made better use of the backyard. Uh, and so that's the story on the pool, but that was a separate permit that we've opened and shut and completed. Okay. Google Earth has not been updated then, so. What's that? <laughs> so Google Earth has not been updated then. Correct. So, all right, yeah, as far as I'm concerned, you know, it's in the back. The, I remember when this originally came, I believe there was a fire in the building. That whole south side two story is new. It's, you know, it's less than 20 years old, I believe, at this point, um, which probably, by the way, would never get approved these days. Probably not. So, um, you know, as far as a two car garage in the back, I, I'm, I'm in favor of it. And if Roger's going to do the, the non-tinted glass and the, you know, true wood trim, um, all the better. So, you know, I look at the long game. If this makes this house more um, permanent, I guess you could say, and more livable, that's what we want for our historic districts. We want people to be able to move in and make minor revisions that make them more up-to-date and livable without scraping the lock clean and starting over. That's my thought. I agree, it makes it much more functional and it is subordinate, secondary and subordinate. That goes along with exactly what we've said all night that our board is, is working towards is making modest adjustments that make these structures more livable. I had two quick questions for, for Roger. Um, I, I'm not sure I understand the, the uh, issue of two garage doors versus one garage door. You, you proposed one garage door because that makes it less, that it cuts off about two feet. Well, if we were to call them in between, if we were to separate and make them two separate doors, there, obviously there'd have to be a column in between, and that would be at least a foot wide. So, so you're, we would be, you know, we, that foot would have, the, the width of our overall garage would have to grow by that foot. You know, we, we, there's, there's no fat in the width of the garage right now to take that up or to absorb that. So we're trying to keep the garage as petite and, you know, uh, subordinate as possible. A and driving in and out of a, an eight foot wide single car garage is tricky, you know, it, it, it's much better driving in and out of a 16 foot wide opening, whether you're keeping one car in there or two. So and, and staff, the suggestion of two garage doors was for what purpose? 
that it reflects that it's okay. 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 So under under section four five one, there is a section um, in the historic code that mentions um, garages and carports, and it specifically says that um, two car garages um, should specifically have two um, two doors. Okay. Mm -hmm. And and the other question, Roger, is uh, right now the garage that is not used is accessed from Swinton, and you are going to have access, the new garage access from the alley. Its garage door faces Swinton, but I've known Betty and Frank Rouser, the prior owners, since like 2004. There's never been a car or an automobile in that garage since then. We, 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 the three of us walked in there this afternoon. We're pretty sure there hasn't been a car in there in like 50 years. So if it gained access from Swinton when it was first built, that was a long, long time ago. And it, it, you know, it's just a glorified storage shed uh, these days, you know. So uh, we're, we're keeping the drive to it from Swinton. Uh, we're, we don't want to change the dynamic of the hardscape. We're not going to drive a car into it from Swinton. We're going to gain full access from the alley. So um, the garage that we see from Swinton does not really have a door in it. The it, door, it, the real doors are in the back, off the alley. Yeah, but we, but to make it look his, as historic as uh, as original, we're going to give the garage door appearance on the Swinton uh, elevation. We okay. want to keep that garage door in, in the in the appearance of it. But it's only an appearance. It's not well, we, we may choose to make it operational, but we, we, not to drive a car through it, to maybe okay. load things into, into the garage for some reason. Okay. Thank I'm you. Sorry to interrupt, but the, that one that's visible would be a single car garage. Yes, that piece, that piece is a single car piece, yeah. In fact, we've We've, staff has asked us if we can somehow salvage the original door that's out there today, we plan on reusing it. It's, a, it's a, like a 1% chance, uh, uh, but you know, and if we can't use it, we will replicate it and make it look as if it were original. There's nothing really special about the original door anyway. But. So if you plan to, Roger, if you plan to use, I guess the shell of a NOA door, and apply something to the outside. Is that what you're saying? Yes, that's that's what everybody does. Everybody does that, except that's... for the two houses to the south of us. Okay. okay. They didn't add anything. And then sheet sheet A seven point zero. Yes. Um, yeah, the one that's showing. You see the bottom elevation. How the fenestrations are kind of off to the center. Is that just a CAD thing, or you, you see what I'm saying? Word, no. Above the word proposed. Above that's the word proposed. That's not being touched, right? If you compare that to the elevation above. No. Okay. I don't think so. I don't think, yeah, yeah, I, I think I follow just, you. Okay. That's the screen record. That's a what? That's the screen. The screen's with the Oh, the, that's the brick screen uh, wall that we decided we don't want to remove. Okay, thank you. It, it's, it's I'm not sure what it screen, it doesn't really screen anything. But uh, I'm also happy to say that earlier in the evening, we think our neighbor to the north was here. We're not sure. She absolutely loves our project, and she's about to uh, make application to improve their entire property. So we've spawned some economic development right next door. <laughs> <laughs> Can I hear from staff? I have a question um, before you leave. Yes. Um, so we were not under the impression that the garage door that faces east would potentially be faux. And I think that's what I heard. Was potentially what? A faux garage door and not a real opening and operable garage door. I show it as an operable door. Okay, I just want to be clear because if you're thinking of making it a faux garage door, we would need to make that clear tonight. Uh, no, well, I, then I, that's a clarification to me. Okay. It's an opening in the wall with a garage, with a single garage door infill so it could absolutely and will be used as an opening okay. a car will not yeah i'm not as concerned about what drive a through car it. drives through i'm more concerned that it a moped opens. maybe yeah that it opens <laughs> or golf cart or whatever yeah, yeah. i just wanted to be it's sure not that. faux in any way we don't yeah, yeah, that's we don't do faux stuff okay 
No problem. Thank you for letting me ask that. Thank you for the clarification. Yeah, I was just saying that, you know, as far as the width of the door, I could see if it was facing Swinton, absolutely, we would want to see two facing the alley and the way it's going to look. I'm not too concerned about it. And trying to, the turn radius from an alley into a garage, I don't even know how you would do that on an eight foot wide door. So I think this is a good compromise. It looks like two, Staff. but it's one. So just to clarify, if the board chose to put forth a requirement for two garage doors, they are required to have a certain distance of backup space. It's 24 feet um, from the back of the parking space so that it can function like a real parking lot. So that turning radius requirement can be met. That's why that is in our code. There's a module distance from the front of the parking space to the west side of the alley, that that be 42 feet, and they've everything's fine on the plan as far as I understand. So those minimum requirements are there. That's why the garage is set in a little bit so that they can get, and Roger may have something to add, but that was something we looked at. Well, I, I was just going to show the site plan that I had that shows the degree of improvement that already exists in our alley. Our, our alley is is very improved and has a, is that the, uh, yeah, that's the existing, uh, or the, that's a proposed site plan. So everything you see in the upper left hand uh, area that's opposite that garage, it's a very wide, it's very wide at that, it's the widest at any part down the alley. So, uh, so, so getting a car in and out of our garage, we are the beneficiary of having a really nice and, and, and super improved alley behind us. Most alleys uh, that are unimproved are like 15 to 16 feet wide. Ours is 20. And you're still asking for just one opening, not two. Yeah, we, no, we're not, not asking for two openings. Way on that one. Yeah, you just, uh, yeah. I, I think what we're hearing from the board is that there's leaning towards we would really like two doors and is that something that the applicant would consider as a condition of approval? Yeah, we really not, we don't want to consider that at all. <laughs> it, it Let's be clear, I'm okay with one. I'm fine with that. I'm okay with one too because it makes the garage bigger you have to make the garage wider, which encroaches closer to the pool and closer mm -hmm. to the house and takes up more footage on your lot. I'm in favor of one. Not, I mean, just to stand on my soapbox for a second, you know, all this new modern uh, sugar cube architecture, non-historic, they have these essentially unusable garages, uh, whether they're single car, single door, double, double car. We're, we actually want a usable garage, but we don't want it to be any wider than it absolutely has to be. And we, we've, we're giving it 10 times more detail than any other garage around us. So uh, I'm not sure why you couldn't support that. And I think you are supporting that. I have a question. Is there a minimal size for a garage door that we need to meet? Is 16 the minimal? 16 is the, well, they make 12, you know, the, so there's car, there's car and a half. There, there, uh, uh, there's an 18 foot double wide garage door and there's a 20 foot. So, so we're using the smallest double car garage door that I'm aware of on the market, 16. And per code it's allowed here uh, in the city. Code doesn't really get into that. Does it, does it matter? No. So from a, I think Roger's speaking building code, from our code requirements, um, a standard parking space is nine foot wide by 18 foot deep. So if you have a garage door opening that's only 16 foot wide, you're barely gonna be able to fit two cars if they're nine foot, you know, that's our requirement. Now granted, when you pull into a parking space, you have room to open your doors. So will it function? Probably, but 16 is still pretty tight. Um, to pull a car in. I'm just wondering because I'm working on another project where the, the city is requiring us to do 20 foot 
double doors. And they're not allowing us to do 18. So I was just a little surprised that we were the allowing city? 16. The city, yeah, the new, new construction on federal. And Delray. Mm -hmm. So we've had discussions internally across the department um, that there should be a minimum size requirement for the garage, particularly because you have sometimes it's more of a constrained site and you have trash inside the garage or wash machines, laundry facilities, and having that additional space, you can't really park a car in a garage. And that's not how this garage is designed, um, but that's an interior measurement that we've been talking about, the 20 foot on the inside. Um, 18 would be the minimum requirement for a two car garage. But would this get approved at 16 foot because we're He's got that. other parking so. on the site in the front. There's some in um, like a circular drive in the front and that they're allowed to have that in the parking court. You can see what's there. So whether or not it's usable we to pull two cars in, you know that a 16 foot garage door is pretty small. It is small, but we're, we're confident that it's, extreme, it's not extremely usable, it's very usable. The, the two down uh, from us that we've shown photographic examples of, those are both 16. Now, I'm not aware, of you, I'm not saying you're incorrect, but I'm not aware of any building code or, or, or code within the city of Delray. That's not, but they're making us do it. So, well, how about we stick to the application that's yeah, before just, the board? Saying, and I, I wonder if this would even go through. Though. That's my that's my question. I, it, this will it? absolutely go through. And William's right. That's we stick to the topic. But the yeah. issue is that it, what you're talking about, Chris, is it's based on the size of the parking space requirements by code. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I can't I, speak to your specific application that you're making. But nine by eighteen is a parking space size. 18 long, nine wide. You know, and we're not Thank filling, you. we're not filling our lower garage, the, the, the garage with. Roger, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I think we're ready for a motion. I think Please. you're going to like Thank it. You. So I think. <laughs> give us a minute. It's 10, 17 at night. So. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to make a motion that we approve the certificate of appropriateness demolition and variance 20 dash or 2022 dash 294 for the property located at 226 North Swinton Avenue. Old School Square Historic District by finding that the request and approval thereof is consistent with the comprehensive plan, and meets criteria set forth in the land development regulation subject to the following conditions, that clear no tint glass be used and that the wood trim on the new garage is real wood. And before a second, um, uh, notation about that brick wall that they're keeping as well. And the existing brick wall on the east elevation is to remain. And that the single front door will remain a usable door? And the east facing garage door is a usable door. This is a real okay. team effort. I like this. Diane has a second. Sorry, I was writing. <laughs> I'm ready for the roll. Ivan Heredia? Yes. Kristen Finn? Yes. Rhonda Saxton? Yes. John Miller? Yes. Jim Chard? Yes. Chris Cabeza? Yes. Elise Lindstrom? Yes. Congratulations. Motion carries. Yeah, Roger, get your, get your plaque to go. <laughs> your props. <laughs> it worked, didn't it? Clearly it did. All right, uh, legislative items. Do we have any reports or comments? So reports and comments. Um, our next meeting is July 5th. City Hall is closed on the 4th, but we are having our meeting on the 5th. Um, I'm not really sure what's on the agenda right now. We're waiting for some applicant resubmittals to come in. Um, I trust you all heard about the accident that occurred on the Sunday Village property. Um, a crane fell and there were four workers injured. I have not heard an update um, since that, that they were being sent to the hospital to be treated. Uh, but OSHA did go to the site. I was out there. They were on site by four o'clock that afternoon 
to complete their investigation. And I don't have an update beyond that. Um, is there anything else? When did that happen? We're back at work. Yeah. What day did that happen? Uh, it was about three, four days ago, something like that. It was last, last week. Um, the golf course. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> uh, so last night at this, or yesterday afternoon, yesterday evening, the city commission provided direction to staff to pursue historic designation of the golf course. So we'll be working that into our schedule. Um, Michelle, there is some confusion as to whether it's both the front and back nine. You might want to clarify that. Yeah. Honestly, I was deep in presentation mode getting ready for tonight. So I still need to go back and listen to the meeting myself. Because yeah. I, I think the, the wording is the Donald Ross nine. It's not the entire Dick Wilson and Donald Ross. I'll, I'll definitely go back and listen to the meeting. And I, I do know that the Citizens Committee wants to make it both. So. We have quite the docket of things to accomplish ahead of us, um, including Frog Alley that were, was in a pause state that has to uh, restart. Atlantic Avenue really has absorbed a lot of our resources on top of the applications. Um, We've got quite a few big applications in right now as well. So we're busy on a good note. Um, the next steps, we, I think I've given you this update before, but the cemetery um, grant that we um, were pursuing from the state, I understand the funding has come through. I don't know if I've told this board this or not, but the grant application, the federal government provides some funding to the state and then the state takes that amount of funding and distributes it to certified local governments on top of what they give from a legislative budget. So every time you apply for grants, you might have 50, 60 applicants, maybe all 50 or 60 get funded, maybe 30 get funded, but the, the top grant applications always get funded. So half of our project was a federally funded project, which I actually didn't realize until Price had brought that up. I thought we were ranked eight. We're actually ranked five on the state list and we were ranked third on the federal list. So that's quite a wonderful achievement and commitment and funding from the grant selection committee. So our next step is to get purchasing going so we can advertise for a contractor consultant. Um, so that's going to be coming along and we'll be working through that process to study the, the cemetery. What's the contractor going to do? So we have to engage a um, historic preservation consultant who specializes in surveying. And when I say surveying, it's more studying, not a physical survey like a surveyor would do. Um, assessing the property for historic integrity. It also includes a geographic information system expert, GIS, uh, because they're going to collect geodata on all of the locations of the plots and the cemetery burial plots and the site itself. So they can upload all of that into a GIS system with all of the data they collect for each burial. Um, they'll be studying the time period of the sections what's on the monuments, names, birth, death, military rank, if available, um, trying to determine if there was any segregation occurring in the cemetery. So it's a very specialized field. Uh, the professional is, is involved. Where's the cemetery? It's the municipal cemetery that's on 10th, Southwest 10th Street mm -hmm. and 8th mm. Avenue. Yeah. Would, would that include the reinterment of African Americans from north of Lake Ida down there? Is that, would that be part of the history? Um, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Um, there's definitely some stories that we've talked about with the community. People who um, lived in and around the cemetery on one particular street was always the route for the um, 
the hearse and the family vehicles coming into the site and exiting the site. And they've told stories about how they remember going out to pay respects to the processional going by. So there's a lot of backstory. I don't know how far in we're going to get with it. The, the reason I ask is obviously there was another cemetery before for African Americans and those were reinterred down to the, uh, the 10th Avenue. Yeah, there's a lot of information that's not, there's a lot of details that are missing on information that we know about. For instance, the town of Delray Platt, the original 1800, 1890 Platt, 1890s Platt, um, had the Bay Ridge Cemetery and the Pine Ridge Cemetery. The Pine Ridge Cemetery is this cemetery. The Bay Ridge Cemetery is over on the Barrier Island. And so I don't know where those people ever moved. There's articles in newspapers from people who lived in that area that said they weren't. Um, I'm curious to know where were the sailors from the Incholva wreck buried? Is that where they are? But there is a note on the, the Pat Casey showed me this many years ago, Bay Ridge Cemetery right on the plot. Yeah. So it's gonna be a great effort. Um, our number one goal is getting this consultant secured in a timely manner, which is gonna take quite a bit um, from a purchasing perspective because we have to advertise for them. I have two quick questions. Um, what we approved tonight uh, in terms of uh, Atlantic Historic District was only for the local register, is that correct? Yes. So do we need to also consider the national register or is that a sequential? It definitely is something that can be considered and we could even talk about with our nonprofit partners in the community. Um, for those who were involved, I looked at John Miller saying he was, um, remembers the details of when Old School Square was designated the Preservation Trust, um, engaged a consultant to begin that effort. So um, it's a conversation that we need to have on further detail. I'm honestly fried right now. I don't know answers <laughs> to everything, um, but it certainly qualifies. That's the good news from the report. Yeah. When is that uh, gonna come before commission? Sorry, Jim. So the, um, what you worked on tonight is going to go to PZB. I believe we're still double checking that it has to go to the planning and zoning board at this point. Um, that would be later this month. And I'm looking at the second meeting of July, I think it's the 18th, which is a first reading. Nothing really happens at first reading. And then the second reading in August, um, I haven't nailed the date down yet. I'm working with Mr. Heisenbottle to make sure I have him available for that meeting. Didn't you say the DDA also? Oh yes, yeah. the DDA on Monday. On oh, Monday? Yes. Okay. Uh, my, my other quick question was, uh, I drive by the uh, restoration of the building on South Swinton East Side every day and, and uh, marvel at what it is, but all of a sudden, all of the old pieces have seemingly disappeared, the shingles and what was left of the studs and so forth, and it's all, it appears to be all new cement block. Do you have Yeah, a, a lot of that project was a replacement restoration rehabilitation um, they had come back before the board, I think they were before the board at least three times uh, for a variety of requests. When they got their original approval, the next step, which is the natural progression, is the applicant goes in for an interior demolition permit and they start peeling the walls apart inside to make sure that when they go to 100% construction drawings from 30%, that they are doing their structural correctly. When they pulled the interior elements apart, the structural integrity was a hot mess in that building. And that is the best way to explain it. I mean, there were roof trusses where there were supposed to be supports and there were pieces of tongue and groove siding or floorboard that was stuck in between the rafters holding the roof up, which is why the roof had such a bad dip. Um, there were sections of studs in the walls that were completely missing any structural support going down to um, 
a floor plate. So there was, there, that's quite a project. And they did, we didn't have comfort with approving a lot of that administratively, so we made them come back. They came back three times, maybe four. But yeah, it's, it's a big, big project that involves a lot, and that was all board approved, <laughs> so. I, I, I'm just saying it looks very different this week than say two weeks ago, because there was something left, some remembrance of the history. And I haven't gone walking through it or anything, but it looks like that is all gone now. They're coming back with all natural, all authentic materials to replicate what was there. That was the board's requirement. So any gingerbreading, any shingles that looked like in the scallop pattern that were up in the gables and the, the siding was shingle, all of that's going back in the same profile with wood. Now there is a large L-shaped addition that wraps the north and east sides of the building. Yeah. That I'm not referring to. I yeah, understand this is the that. south side. But is there going to be anything original left, or is it all going to be? A lot of what's happening is going to have to be replacement. Yeah. Yeah. Which you can do. You can replace materials with approval. So. It's sort of like the train station. Not quite. The train station was a little bit different. That's a reconstruction. This one is a rehabilitation. Okay. It's in the worst case scenario when you have to replace materials, that's when you replace. You try to preserve and reuse, but in that instance, they, they were faced with quite the challenge. I'd like to thank you for what a nice presentation you did on Atlantic Avenue. I think everybody in the audience appreciated the the way you did it and the um, interest that you were able to keep our interest during the whole thing too. Yeah. It was uh, really great. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, <laughs> make me blush. <laughs> it, it's really hard to describe so much so quickly, so I'm sorry it went so long. Um, but thank you for that feedback. Seems short. It yeah, it didn't, it didn't feel long, but... Well, they were saying it was an hour, thorough. and I'm like, was it an hour? <laughs> so, but thank you. I really appreciate that. All we're the excited. attorneys got paid by the hour, so they don't care. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. We're excited. We're hopeful. I'm glad to see that we had such a nice turnout, too. Yeah. Okay. All right, positives. shall we adjourn? Yes. Thank you. Bye. Good night. Good night.